Okay, and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy, and More. Tonight, I am very excited to bring to you Marco Verisco. How are you doing, Marco? Doing pretty good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And uh, Marco um, is a very uh, talented musician, singer, songwriter, and we're going to learn all about his, uh, his journey and what he's been up to in just a few. So Marco, um, sometimes I like in the beginning to let people know how we met. Uh, if there's any memory you have of how we met, what would it be? Ooh, uh, I think that really it's a group of memories that I have specifically, specifically with you because you know, it, our memories are going to be a little different because obviously we were in a different age group. Uh, you know, this is coming from my childhood where, you know, the memories that you have are a child are very surreal and very um, important. And, and uh, they almost feel like larger than life, let's say, because they're so important to, you know, when you develop that you have certain people that uh, that you know influence you and 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 you know take you under their wing and I think that the memories that I have with you all tell me that you know you are exactly that person you know uh, I think the memories that I have is you know going three three blocks down uh, mm -hmm. from where my house is from where I grew up and going to the local piano school and you know jamming out with you and you know the the best of memories yeah that's awesome man yeah I, I uh... Briefly, when we, we, we spoke uh, recently, and I was thinking about when I first met you, and I just remember this bright-eyed kid coming in with a lot of enthusiasm, and and I love that you always called me John right from the beginning, you know, and uh, a lot of kids don't do that, you know, and you were just like, yeah, this is, I guess this guy's going to be my new friend, and, you know, you well, just talk to me, and uh, I don't, I don't recall, <laughs> but like, because obviously there was other teachers at the school, but like, what was the, what was the norm to call? teacher uh, was, well, it, was, I, was it mr sheridan was it supposed to be mr. Uh, <laughs> um at some point i i, I latched on to the mr john thing probably later later years later just because uh you know um miss yan would always would be for, referred to miss yan i heard other teachers it was just kind of like a way i didn't like mr sheridan so i didn't go that route yeah so i figured mr john not that i wouldn't have expected you to call me that because i didn't go by that at the time but uh and I don't know, I just, I think a lot of students would just not even think to call a teacher by name or think to even say the name, you yeah. know, that that's just teacher, <laughs> you know. Well, you know, that was never out of some, any, any kind of like thinking that you were less respected. That was far from it. You know, I, I think that we were very much, uh, you know, close and that we, we shared a lot of similar musical aspirations and the way that at least you taught me how to approach music, I think was exactly what I liked about it. And, and uh, you know, I think that we were on a, we were on a, a different kind of level, I'd say. Yeah, I, that definitely feels, feels uh, true to me as well. And, and I bring that up just because it stands out, not by no means that I, that I wish it was any different, that you didn't call me by my, you know, I think that was great. It's just, it's something I remember. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> All right, cool. So I uh, just want to say hello to everyone on, on you, uh, Facebook who's watching live. Thank you for being here. And uh, as we go on, feel free to comment and let, let us know what you're thinking. If you have any questions for Marco or myself, please go ahead and or comments. We'd love to hear from you and feel free to share and like the video. All right, so moving on. So we, we talked a little bit about how we met. And uh, yeah, beyond that, uh, I'll just touch a little bit more that um, I was just impressed by your uh, bright energy and that you just really love music and you I don't know there was just like this level of honesty between us that somehow existed it, it was there that uh, we saw each other as souls maybe you could say you know then I guess that's what the John thing was like all right this guy is my uh, equal of course we're all equals but like yeah. at, at that age you already you recognize it and I recognize it so um it was, it was refreshing. Actually, you know, now that now that you bring it up, I think that one particular memory that stuck with me was that um, we, you know, of course, we had our usual lessons at the, you know, at the studio, at the music studio, um, you know, a couple of blocks from from where I lived. Um, but I just remember this one time, I think I was like getting ready. I was preparing for 
a concert where I had to do like a, a, a you know, a, a, a difficult piano piece. And I think that there was one time where, you know, you, you came over my house and you did the lesson there because there was some conflict where, you know, uh, to the schedules didn't meet up. So you said, you know what, I'll come a different time. And you know what, you'll, I'll come over later in the evening. And, you know, you, just, you stopped by and you did the lesson at my house rather than going to the studio. And I think I remember that time because, you know, it seemed like it was one of those moments where I don't think with any other teacher that would have been the case. You know, you came over, I think you, you know, my mom had like snacks laid out, you know, gave you a little like a toasted bread with cheese, like a, a super Italian thing. I remember, you know, uh, made you feel welcome. And we just sat by my old, you know, my old uh, upright piano and we worked on that piece. And uh, that's, that's one of the memories I have. And I think that's also very special that we were able to kind of roll with the punches in that sense. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I remember the day I went to your house and uh, I don't know if, did I go to your house more than once? Cause I, I think you did. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I feel like there was a time I, I was had dinner or something and there was I had a glass of wine or something I think oh, so no. or lunch I don't know what it was but uh yeah and uh yeah I thought that was that was cool that we were able to just talk as as person to person and and you know between with your mother's help of course coordinating things and uh yeah I I, I just want to see you succeed and I felt that uh and for all my students I do feel that way but especially when someone shows this like purity of like uh, intention you know and des desire for music you know I, I do want to go at it my way you know and uh, you gave me that opportunity and you were that type of person and and also you know your family yeah was able to go there too and of course the second thing because I'm glad you brought up oh you came over more than once you did I think the second time you came over was we were jamming out in this very basement that, I, that I'm in right now in my, in my music studio. Mm -hmm. and that was at a time where I just had, you know, my single MacBook, you know, with GarageBand. Uh, and I had like maybe one single USB microphone. And what we did, we just recorded anything that we knew, anything we knew. You know, if we both knew a song together, we recorded it together. And, you know, just single microphone, you were on the guitar. I think I was on the piano and, you know, just one session. And it was it was the coolest thing, you know. Hmm. Yeah, that, that that yeah that that rings a bell. I remember coming downstairs and, and seeing your studio, and I was like, "Wow, this guy's got a studio already," you know. And you know, you were you were a young kid. It was you it know? was. It's not what it's not what it <laughs> right now. This now I call it a recording studio. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I'm sure you got you're totally decked out for like the real deal now. But just the fact that you had something, even approaching a studio at that age, was just so exciting. It, it reminded me of myself you know, at, at a young age, of course, whatever, or, or whatever we're, whatever we uh, had at a certain age would be different because of the era and all that. But uh, yeah, that, that was fun. That well, was fun. You know, John, that was, you know, that, that, especially at that time, and it's still, it still is, but I mean, like, it was important then, just as it is now that that was my life. That was my life. You know, the things that I looked forward to, you know, after coming home from school was, you know, uh, coming home and recording a song or working on music. And, uh, you know, it was it was very it was a very special journey to learn how to, you know, build, you know, a space to create. And uh, that definitely was um, a really, really uh, long but uh, important process that I think I went through. Yeah, yeah, I guess I, I remember those from from my perspective. There were those crucial moments because I met you. I, I think we agreed two thousand six ish. I, I know I definitely knew you in two thousand six. Yeah, I think so too. Because I remember, I think I left your house. Actually, funny story that I left your house from that other meeting when I had a glass of wine or dinner or whatever, mm -hmm. and I went home on the bus. And that day was like the final meeting with my band at the time, level six. Yeah. It was like this like meeting of doom, you know, and like we had to like get together and hope no one killed each other. It was right after coming home from your house that happened. And uh, that was that was like uh, November or October 2011. Oh, sorry, it's 2006. So so I know at least I knew you at that point. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so I want to get to some questions. Um, yeah, so let's just jump in. So, Marco, can you remember what it was that got you into enjoying music in the first place? 
yeah. what were some of your earliest inspirations? So music has been a part of my life and an important part of my life ever since I was about five years old. Um, one of the earliest memories that I have is going over my uncle's house in Jersey. He has a really, he had a really cool house in the countryside. And, you know, of course, when I went over there, I loved, you know, seeing my cousins and my family. But one of the things that I remember is just being so excited about that one piano in their house that was sitting, you know, against the wall in the corner. It was an upright piano. And it was a little beaten down, you know, and of course it was very standard. Most families, you know, have like, you know, they treat the piano as like a piece of furniture, mm -hmm. but you know, that's what I was drawn to. And I remember so many times, you know, when I went over there, I would just sit by the piano without an ounce of knowledge, just fiddling with the keys and just making my own combinations of what I felt. Oh, this sounds kind of like a song. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was really fascinating to me. And I think that, um, you know, my uncle was nice enough to pass down that very piano to me, and uh, that became my very first piano. And uh, what was important about that piano was, of course, you know, it, it, it sparked my mom to, you know, give me piano lessons, including, you know, the ones that, that we did, um, you know, put me down that path that usually a lot of kids go down is, you know, you learn piano, or, you know, you, you, you perform at the recital and such. But what was more important to me about that piano was the fact that I was learning about, I was learning about uh, my ear. I was learning about the fact that if I wanted to learn a song, let's say I heard a song on, on TV, you know, or in a musical score, a little tune that I liked, you know, without any, without any shred of doubt or, or you know, just for enjoyment, I just go by the piano and say, yeah, I kind of want to try to learn this song a little bit. And and somehow without any sheet music, you know, I'd, I'd be able to pick up on it and start, you know, playing a, a little bit, you know, and, and I think that that was um, around the time where I guess, you know, and I spoke to my mom about this, where she said, you know, this, you know, this kid has an ear for music. And, uh, and that, that, that's, that's the big thing. And of course, that led me down the path to like, you know, be in the school band and, and, you know, you know, compose music and, of course, take further lessons and and kind of make that my childhood. But of course, your question was, you know, what when did I start having a passion for music? Right. Or what are your early inspirations, earliest inspirations and enjoying it? Yeah, I'd say doing great. Thank you. I'd Keep say going. I'd say I didn't start the time that I started enjoying music and the time I started seeing it as a true passion was when I was 11 years old and I discovered the Beatles. <laughs> I remember that day, you know, it was, it was a summer day. I was coming home from uh, Rockaway Beach and we were all in the car with my family and uh, we were tuned to some random radio station and the song Help came on the station. Oh. And, you know, I asked my mom, I was like, mom, what's this song? It's the coolest song. And she's like, oh, that's Help. It's the Beatles. You ever heard of the Beatles? I was like, no. And from that moment, I rushed out of the car and I went on, I went on to YouTube and, and searched every single Beatles video I could find and seeing, you know, iconic stuff like the music video, video for help and, and then performing it at Shea Stadium. And, and I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And at that time, that's when I decided to pick up the guitar, teach myself the guitar, pick up the drums, teach myself the drums. And even the bass too, but you know, of course, you know, the guitar is similar to the bass in the first four strings. But you know, that's what pushed me to become a multi-instrumentalist and start to record music, perform music, and have a passion for music. And of course, this leads me to you as well as, as a teacher, because you know, since I started playing when I was five, up until you know, up until maybe nine, you know, up until nine. I had teachers that, you know, taught me the, the classical stuff, you know, the, the typical stuff, teaching me how to sight read, which, was, which of course is very important. But, you know, um, as a child, it, it was hard to, to really develop that skill at such an early age. But with you, there was a change in pace in that you saw music differently in that you saw songs like the beat, like, you know, any song from the Beatles. I remember stuff we like, we worked on Octopus's Garden one time, you know, I'd bring in sheet music and say, this is what I want to learn. And then you, you'd hop on the guitar, I'd, I'd hop on the piano and we'd, we'd, we'd jam out to it. And I think you taught me how to really enjoy music in that sense. And, you know, with that, you know, I was able to learn and comprehend the more technical stuff, especially down the road. Cause you know, the Beatles, 
you know, if you want to talk about their musicality, it's, you know, they very much appreciated the classical stuff and they incorporated it, they incorporated it, especially in their, their, you know, their later stuff. So, you know, the process that I had was, was different. It was from left field, I'd say, or maybe laid back, but it was, it was perfect for me. And it, it brought me down this road where I could enjoy music and have a passion for it. Cool. Yeah. Wow. That, that's, that's fun to hear all that story. And, and it brings me, uh, it brings me um, to mind. Uh, oh, someone actually uh, just, uh, let me answer a comment real quick before I, I say my comment. Paul Senti says, what's Octopus's Garden, LOL. Um, I don't know if they Paul, I don't know if you're uh, um, being you true, but, uh, but go ahead, Marco. Let's uh, just a little bit. I'd like to be under the sea in an octopus's garden in the shade. It was the it was like one of those special Ringo songs that was there's right, always right. one Ringo song on an album, and that was that was a, that was a fun one, you know. Yeah, cool. Thanks for answering that. And and the reason I said uh, only a little bit is not because I don't want to hear you play, but uh, YouTube will uh, Facebook will catch it and it'll, it'll mute that out later okay. on the replay. Is that a good amount? Is that a good amount? Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, okay. Because I did something. No, thank you. Um, I'm glad you did play that. I uh, I put on my own music and I did like a podcast and I shared recordings of my own and explained it and on the on the playback all the music was just taken out your own music all my music yeah oh. which is kind of cool like to know that other people can't do it but yeah. including me <laughs> so anyway um anyway paul senti says thanks nice so you awesome. made it clear um yeah so yeah so the you starting at five so a big difference with you compared to the other students I've had. And this is not saying one or the other is better, but, but what made our, us connect so much, I think, is that I really went to my first guitar lessons when I was 11 with this desire to learn how to play the music I loved. Yeah. And the guitar teacher I had at the time couldn't really help me with that. So I could relate to those experiences you've had maybe. And then, uh, but the other thing was that you want to play music even be so before I met you, even before you met, you heard the Beatles, you really, you liked music at least, you knew you really liked it. And then uh, by the time you found the Beatles, I remember that, like all of a sudden, it was a little bit, I, I won't say hit or miss before that, but uh, yeah, sometimes you're into it, sometimes you weren't, I mean, you're a young kid, of course, I get it. But um, when that, like, just that light went on, it was just so much fun, like, of course, yeah, let's play help. And then you'd bring it in, you and you would, you know, it, it was very rare for me at that time to find a student who actually did a lot of outside stuff that has nothing to do with me. Like you said, that, that's when I chose guitar. That's when I chose drums. That's amazing because most students, I would have to like tell them to do that, you know, yeah. and, uh, this, you know, not, not a good or bad, not a character judgment for other people, but it just goes to show how, uh, how meant for it you are, I suppose, you know, like this is just in your blood, it's in your soul. And, so it was just so fun. You, you came in, you're like, here's when I'm 64 and you, you played it. And I'm like, oh, that was you one of my, need my, you didn't even need my help for that. You know? Well, I think what was so great about it and, you know, it had to do also with how I got introduced to the Beatles was also, um, I got their, their, their one compilation, you know, with all their, with all their, you know, their, all their hits. And with that CD came a song book, a chord book. And I remember that was the first time where, really music on paper made sense to me because you know and you probably knew this and and it's still you know it's still a thing but sight reading is has always been my big hurdle when it comes to music i could you know i i could read music but you know they these these the the piano lessons they want to teach you how to sight read and they give you exercises for that and that was always that always seemed like extraterrestrial to me but what made so much sense to me was looking at this without any help from anybody else. I was able to open this chord book where, you know, obviously you have, you know, you have the treble clef and the bass clef, but above it, you have the chords. And I was like, I could follow these chords. And it's not just for guitar, it's for piano too. So for once I was able to say, okay, here, here is a vocabulary that I could understand to be the starting point. And that's mm -hmm. really where it took off for me, where I was able to 
take you know something like when I'm 64, bring it over to you and already you know I already know most of the music it was because I was able to look at a chord book where I could see G, G7, D, D7. And you know, some people, you know, some people might say, ah, that's you know, sight reading is important, but then you go to like then you go to uh, you know, I went to high school and I was in the jazz band. And other than sight reading, what was more important was the chords and learning how to make voicings out of those chords. So that songbook was very important in, 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 in teaching me a way that I could, I could work through music. And, 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 you know, you were right along there with me. Yeah, that, that you're coming right out of the very similar school of thought that I, I thrive in, because I'm weak at sight reading on piano for sure. On guitar, I'm not too bad, but still, it's, it's not something I prefer to do. And uh, yeah, so when I found a, a kindred spirit that not only, another important point is that not only did you gravitate to what I just normally, I naturally gravitated to and did, did well myself, mm -hmm. um, but your, your mother was okay with supporting that. Sometimes a parent wants their child to read music and then the teacher has to kind of stick to that, which I never liked because of how limiting it can be, you know, if someone can be more creative by thinking outside the box, let's go there. That was always my thought. But, uh, you know, I understand reading music is super important too in its own way. Um, so Paul Senti says, uh, funny how music really has nothing to do with notes on a staff. Yeah, I could, you know, I could understand that uh, point of view. Um, any uh, comment on that? Well, I don't know. Wait, was he being sarcastic about it? I was trying to see. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, Wait, can you, can you read one more time? I just got to process that. It says, thing. funny how music has really has nothing to do with notes on a staff. Well, I mean that, yeah, that's, well, now I get it. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. I, I mean, you know, it's, it's great to solidify music, you know, especially that's music that's a little more complicated. But I just think that the the genre of music, especially that we were working around, and especially the genre of music that most contemporary musicians are working around, involves interpreting chords, you know, rather mm -hmm. than sticking straight to a score, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then Paul says, uh, does Ray Charles care about that? Ray oh, Floyd, yeah. Right. And well, then, I, uh... I got to say, like, I'm glad Paul brought Ray Charles up because he's one of my big influences, especially when it comes to the piano. And yeah, of course, because it still amazes me how that man was able to do the kind of runs that he did blind. Mm -hmm. You know, that it, it's amazing and that very true, very true, Paul. And then Darlene Carney shares a uh, play by ear. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. A lot of people play by ear um, and a lot of masters played by ear, you know, Jimi Hendrix, from what I know, knew little to no theory and who's mainly playing by ear. Maybe he did know some, I don't know, but I'm sure you could tell he was more of just an intuitive player. Yeah. Uh, so many. Yeah. And when you're creating music, you know, if you're going to be a, a set musician, if you're going to be like a studio musician or, you know, a concert pianist, or you're going to be at an orchestra, obviously those skills are so important. You know, sight reading is so important. Um, I think when you're creating music, that's where having an ear is a big plus because mm -hmm. then you're able to really recognize the vocabulary of music and the tropes of music and be able to put the pieces together on your own to make your own thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, I had a, oh, uh, so Ray Charles triggered the memory, but uh, um, the last um, podcast guest I had, uh, Jen Jennifer Hamity, who's a professional singing coach and therapist, author yeah. now, but she had this um, career as a singer, and uh, she actually had the chance to do backup singing live with uh, Stevie Wonder a few times. Oh wow! So oh, that's that, could have, that must have been pretty fun. Not not Ray Charles, but uh, you know, a similarly very soulful and incredible genius of a musician who didn't read any music, right? I mean, like, not just in that sense, but like Stevie Wonder, he was, he was the, he was the band on most of those records. You know, my favorite records of him are, are, are Higher Ground and I Wish. And, you know, he was very much attuned to that Motown sound. 
which you know was so exciting and 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 so creative and and yeah no he was he he was really special truly special and of course that's just stating the obvious <laughs> yeah he's one of those people that is just obviously on another whole another dimension right yeah so um how would you describe the overall influence music has had in your life up until today yeah well i think two things number one i think that music has inspired me you know no different than it inspires anyone else in that you know i listen to music to 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 get an emotional reaction to be emotionally stimulated um you know that's why we all really listen to music is because either we could like attach a memory to it you know either we feel nostalgic about something or it gets us upbeat you know maybe we want to feel a certain kind of sadness or we want to feel you know we want to feel joy you know we have music for that and you know spotify i mean the like everybody else, I got my playlists every year, you know, I, I load up my play with playlist with songs that, you know, I feel are really special that, that I feel like give me an emotional boost and that I could really appreciate. Um, a clear example I could give is just, I love listening to movie soundtracks on Spotify because that's the, the clearest example of being able, able to listen to a piece of music, have an image ready in your head and being able to feel an emotion based on the sequence that they laid out for you. Um, and so that that's one thing, you know, I'm emotionally driven by music. Um, I think that music, however, in a more personal note, and this really ties in, John, to what we've been talking about so far, because, you know, if you're going to mention my childhood, I, I think it's important to say that, you know, around the time that I started playing music five or six years old, I was actually diagnosed with uh, ADHD. And uh, that was a very, very big part of my childhood where, you know, you know, I had uh, behavioral issues in school. You know, I had a lot of, a lot of trouble paying attention. And of course, you know, that affected my schoolwork and how my teachers saw me, how adults saw me altogether, even, even my own classmates. And, you know, it was, you know, it affected a lot of parts of my childhood. And, you know, I think that looking back at this question, I'd say that music couldn't have come at a better time because music all throughout my childhood and, and now stepping out, being, you know, being a young adult, music was my guiding light. Um, you know, after school, you know, I, there was nothing more that I look forward to than just, you know, going home and working on music, recording in my basement. And of course, I was able to get performance gigs at a young age. I was very fortunate to do that, to, you know, go out and express myself in a way that I know I could express myself and to socialize with people and, uh, you know, being able to be part of community things. Like I love community theater and I was a part of community theater. And I feel like I was able to have a sort of strength socially and, and, uh, and, and to being able to approach you know, approach my childhood in that light was very, very important to me. And with that music really gave me something to strive for and a confidence. And of course, you know, that led to being in the theater program and the music program in high school, you know, it kept, it kept going through. And, and of course, with all this, it, 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 it strengthened me, it, you know, it taught me discipline, it taught me to pay attention. You know, I think that the one thing that we could take away, especially from what we've been talking about is, uh, you know, being able to develop using different approaches and music itself is so important to development and to my development and to where I am today. And I have so much to be grateful for that. I was able to have such an enriching, you know, 23 years now. <laughs> as a bit. Yeah. Oh man. Um, I, yeah, I just, I just want to share, bounce back a little bit with that. Um, I do remember that you were going through those, uh, I guess, social, issues, uh, developmental issues with uh, ADHD, you know, just vague, I was vaguely aware of it. And, but I could see that, you know, music, perhaps because of that, or partly because of that really became something that you said, okay, I'm going to go for this, mm -hmm. and that it truly helped you. And um, that might have been a part of why I, I decided I got to, you know, whatever, if you were a challenging student at times, I'm like, I just saw right through that and said, this guy is going to benefit from really um, getting, learning as much about music as he can, you know, and having someone 
you know, who cares about him as a teacher would help too. So, you know, I saw that and, uh, and I'm just so happy to, that, that it, to, you developed in a way that basically was all that I could ever have hoped for, that you really took it, you ran with it, you became a healthy young man, an artist, you know, you went to college and uh, performed and, and you very socially, uh, you know, have a socially rich life, which, you know, I guess someone who had ADHD, there might be concerns about that when you're a kid, you know, for parental concerns and stuff. So, yeah, I remember seeing that and, and that's uh, just reflecting back a little bit, you know. And, uh, you know, it was all about the process. I mean, and this is like one of the things I ask myself, can I ever be a music teacher? Because the amount of patience that you have to have, because, you know, I think that I think that my, my piano skills at the time were, you know, pretty decent for my age. But what was most important was that, you know, you didn't give up on me. It was about the process. It was about, you know, I remember you told me, you know, when we were talking a little earlier was um, you said that if something didn't stick, if, uh, if, uh, if, if, uh, if we were working on something and, you know, I, it wasn't working out for me, you know, you moved on, you made the decision to say, okay, it's about, it's not about sticking to, you know, learning a piece and being strict about it, but just to go through a process. And I think that was very important. Thank you. Thank you for recognizing that. And on that note, um, I don't know if you've changed your mind since a week ago or two weeks ago, but you said, I don't know if I could be a teacher. It requires so much patience, but I really get the sense you'd be an amazing teacher. Not that you should be. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, but should it happen naturally, I'm, I'm sure you'd be an amazing teacher. Well, well, thank you. I'll, I'll give it, I'll give it, I'll give it a think. <laughs> right. I can multitask. I can multitask. Yes. Yeah. You could always do a little bit here, a little bit there. Yeah. So uh, Paul Senti says, that if it wasn't for uh, music, he thinks he could be on, he could be on the streets, in terms of like how New York City is so crazy that uh, who knows what he would have lost his mind. Maybe, maybe I'm I'm sorry if I'm not uh, if I'm reading into that, Paul. I know I felt that growing up that if I didn't have music, what the heck would I do? You know, I would have lost my mind in, in some ways. Well, I think you know a lot of people forget you know just the the, the the importance of art in general you know it's it, it's it's what we live for and i don't want to sound too preachy about it but it, it really is true these are the things that you know that pull us through the day in the in the best way possible mm -hmm. oh man yeah or i i was uh looking at poetry recently some of my own and some others and uh poetry is a really powerful form and not to get too off topic but uh, it's just like a few words you put arrangement a certain way and you could really evoke a, a feeling like a desire a longing or whatever and you know it shouldn't it shouldn't be overlooked is my suggestion you know that our, the power of us to be creative of course it's not limited to the arts you could be creative creating a meal you could be creative of making your bed you know whatever there's in any way but uh but you know yeah like you're saying if if with, without art if that includes all the arts way I'm using it man what the heck would life yeah would be yeah of course. so let's see um okay I, if you, I think you might have covered this already but if not you could add fill in any gaps uh, what inspired you to take music seriously and pursue it as a career yeah um I mean I, like I said I was very very fortunate at an early age from an early age to perform and to be able to have those experience, experiences and to be able to, for the past 10 or 12 years, uh, you know, play and perform in all these nooks and crannies in New York City. Um, you know, whether it be, you know, public events or, you know, stage theater and, and so on and so forth. Or, you know, I have all these little memories of working with different people. And, and I think that there was a point in my mind where, you know, I said to myself, it wasn't a specific point, but I, 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 I knew that I told myself, hey, this is something that I'm really, really good at. And when I say that, I mean, I'm performing and playing music. I mean, I see myself on a path that I'm very, very passionate about, that I love doing, that I'll sacrifice so much for. And I'll, you know, and I know that there's room for improvement. And, you know, what better path can you be on than that when you could say you could say that to yourself? 
And, you know, I think that it is, it, to me, you know, this is a very touchy question because, you know, it's still a question that I'm asking myself right now, you know, my, I'm, I'm still, I'm still very early in my journey. You know, I'm, I'm 23 years old and fresh out of college and, and, you know, opportunities I, I'm, I'm reaching for all different kinds. Um, but I think that some people may have a, a misconception when it comes to focusing on a music career, because to me, you know, some people could see a music career as a pipe dream and it's far from it, you know, following music and making it a career is just like developing any other career. You know, it's going to be a great challenge. You have to put a, you know, a shitload of work into it and you have to be able to fight for it and, and be creative and, and, and dedicate your life to it if that's going to be a career. And, you know, especially the program, you know, you know, I went to college and I, I went to college for music and I specifically chose a program that taught me all about music itself, not just performing it, not just producing it, but also the business aspect behind it, the marketing aspect behind it, you know, the things that a lot of people don't see behind the scenes. Music is such a broad field that, you know, you could make a, you could make like 50 different careers out of music. But, you know, me, I, I love to perform. It's something that I enjoy doing. You know, I, I have my own setup and my, my plan is simple. It's always simple when performing. You know, I, I haul my seven, you know, my, my 70 pound, you know, bags of equipment, my guitar, my piano, my speakers. I haul it to some place where I could perform. I set it up, I perform, I make tips and, you know, I meet a few people, make some connections, inspire some few people, pack up. And then I start, you know, I start on the next time. You know, it, it's as simple as that, you know, it's, and I, of course, I've been very fortunate to show signs that I'm, that I, that I can do this. You know, I've, I've had performance gigs, you know, for quite a long time and those things build up and you just have to keep working at it. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, I just realized how, how happy I am that uh, uh, kind of my own maturity that I'm willing to how can I say this right away? I'm just so glad I have a young person like you. There's two points here that is willing to courageously stand up and really just speak confidently about what you're doing. Yeah. That's wonderful. And I'm, I'm proud of myself that I'm willing, that I was able to reach out and say, Hey, you want to do this? Because um, I guess there's a little bit of overcoming my own ego to say, let's hear from, from younger people, all people, I don't know. I just want to be frank about that. And because I'm just so glad that you are doing what you're doing and I'm glad this conversation is public so people can hear about it. Yeah. You know, I think that's essentially what I'm getting at. I'm glad we made it happen. Yeah, of course. Um, and uh, we have a comment from Brazil. Oh, wow. Yeah. Raimundo Carlos Salitão says, very good. I love that hug from Brazil. And that was when you were talking about uh carrying your equipment, just do the gig and come back and do it again. You a big hug in. back, a big hug back. Thank you so much. <laughs> big hug back, Raimundo. Abraço, amigo. So, yeah, actually, uh, Raimundo, I have to tell you that uh, uh, Marco was actually uh, a crucial factor, uh, uh, a key player in us going to Brazil because he helped at a fundraising event for us to raise money to go to Brazil. He, he was a performer. So again, John, you know, the trust that you had in me to say, hey, we're having this gig, you know, you know, it's to raise money, come on stage and perform with us, you know, you will perform your songs, but you'll also perform with us. And I remember that day, it was, a, you know, it was a really great evening, you know, you had your guitar, you know, a couple other of your bandmates and, you know, you had a drum set with, uh, with some with some brushes, you know, like, I mean, like, a, just a snare drum and brushes. And that was the rhythm section. And, you know, just 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 to the it was just the meat and potatoes of, of enjoying music and 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 it was a great night i remember i still remember it and i still remember saying goodbye to you and it was very it was it was it was it was hard saying goodbye it really was it you know it was um but i was very happy for you too yeah i see i remember that now that i felt uh i don't know if guilty is the right word but i felt sad like hey that's life does that to people you know sometimes relationships end for for a time or they end permanently or whatever and I was you know naturally you were going to focus on your life young life at the time and and I had a new mission and uh 
fortunately we kept in touch one way or the other, uh, even, if, even if distantly and then now reconnected here. So uh, yeah. It, but I uh, think it was also, now that I'm thinking about it now that it's brought up, I think it was also really cool to have a mentor and I do consider you one of my mentors that I've had, you know, music wise, a mentor that was able to make a decision and say, I'm traveling the world. I'm going here and I'm going there. I believe you went to, you also went to India, right? As well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Th those things stuck in my mind and I said, wow, this is, you know, and uh, I think that's just as important to be able to, you know, like I said, I was very happy that you were doing that. It was, it was really cool to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I remember like amidst that, this was what I had to, what I felt my soul was calling me. And I did feel, like I said, felt a little bit sad or bad. I don't know what the right word is, but for, for the few people such as yourself, who I would like to have been around for, continue to have been around for at that time, but you know, life, life calls and uh, you'll see in your life when that, those type of things may happen. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. And I did sense your support, even if, even if it was hard for you and uh, your mother's support, and it was, was really appreciated. Mm. Um, and Paul Senti, oh, Paul Senti, um, who was commenting before, uh, says, uh, um, I played Brazil once, and then he, uh, he put a video to his band playing Brazil. Yeah, his band, uh, Dirty Mother Nation, um, was a band that I was performing alongside. Our bands were performing the New York club scene at the same era uh, they they went a little bit longer after we broke up but uh, yeah I, I, paul are you from paul are you from bensonhurst because marco's a bensonhurst beth beach guy i don't know exactly where you were located I'd anyway love, love to connect it would be really great and, you know he's been he's been really invested in this podcast <laughs> yeah paul. No, i only i only you know i only know one brazilian song actually i uh, once once in a while uh, you know it's I, I pop it on my spotify playlist it's um from the the group i think brazil 66 uh, masquinata it's it's mm. like in all the it's all like it's in all the tv you know the you ring a bell mm. no is brazil 66 with, is that something herb alpert was a part of i like i said it's just a song to me <laughs> yeah yeah um, oh man, yeah, I, I played, uh, learned a lot, not that many, but quite a few Brazilian songs. I, I recorded one, it's up on Spotify. It's the one that does best on Spotify for me, whatever reason. It's the Portuguese version, Brazilian Portuguese version of uh, Knocking on Heaven's Door. Oh yeah, yeah. great. <laughs> um, all right, so um, I visited your website and as well as your social media and I've listened to your music, or quite a lot of it, um, or on repeat, you know, and in the past uh, couple of weeks, but also, you know, even before, whenever something is released, I would check it out. Yeah. It's very polished, uh, well-written, catchy. Um, yeah. So what was your journey like developing those skills as a songwriter? Yeah. So I hate to be a broken record player, but honestly, all roads lead back to the Beatles for me. And ever since, like I said, ever since I started listening to the Beatles, that's what compelled me to start to write songs and record songs. And I remember this was before, it was like, well, I think 2007, 2008. I had, a, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any technology to record music. And I knew very little about the technology to record music. But of course, in all the, you know, in all the videos, I'd see the, the, the big fancy recording studio. And that's what my dream was ever, you know, that was my dream. I wanted a big fancy recording to studio to record all my songs. What I did to begin with was rather interesting. You know, I had a video camera that was hooked up to my mom's computer. And what I would do is try to solve this major dilemma in that I was a multi-instrumentalist at that time. I was playing guitar, I was playing piano, I was playing drums and I was playing bass. How could I get myself sounding like a band where I could take all these instruments that I'm playing and all these parts and arrange it into a song that I could stack it together and multi-track. And the way that I did it early on uh, with the technology I had is that I'd record myself on video playing the first instrument and then I download that video, put it on the computer. 
And then I'd use the playback from the computer of that first instrument, play along with it on a second instrument and, and record it again on, on the video. And you follow? And then I just kept doing that over and over. And obviously it's going to sound super crappy, but that was my way of getting an arrangement together. The, the, just the, the basics of, of putting together, you know, multi-tracking basically. And that was, that was the start of my journey. Cause, and from then on, I did everything I could to, to try to make my, you know, my, make my music sound better because, you know, of course I was a performer first at the time. Uh, you know, I performed music. That's all I knew. And my, the question that I asked myself is how could I get myself to sound a certain way on record that it sounds exactly like me performing in real life. And that was the, the basic idea. Then around 10 or 11, I got my first MacBook and my God, like my, my eyes opened up. Uh, you know, I had GarageBand and wow, I could record one part and then I could record another part and then another part without having to do that thing that I did with the video camera. I could just multi-track however I want. And of course it was with the crappy computer microphone. So, you know, once again, it still wasn't, it still wasn't good, but I was still, I was learning and I was learning and I was doing a lot of trial and error. And I was in this basement, I was on the drums trying to see how I could make the drums sound cool. Where could I place the computer so that it would sound the best where it won't sound like super distortion. And I tried, you know, I'd song, I'd write different songs that were so campy and, you know, obviously they were very, very childish back then, but you know, it was a process. Um, but with that, every Christmas and every birthday was a step forward because, you know, obviously all I had was my allowance and the good graces of my parents that you know, God bless them. They, they really, they were part of this journey for me and I have so much to thank, but you know, they, I'd get a guitar for Christmas and an electric guitar for Christmas. Great. Now I have an electric guitar. Now I can record more of a rock sound. Uh, I got an amplifier for Christmas, you know, so it kept, it kept building up until of course, I, I financed my own stuff and then continued on. And, you know, this is what it's led up to where I have this, you know, this really great recording space now, where as you can see, I got my rocket five speakers. I got my soundboard here, you know, my piano, my, my microphone, my Neumann microphone, uh, microphone, microphone. Um, and now like I've, I've, I, I know I've got, you know, what I need to record. Uh, and and achieve that thing where I'm I'm performing, I'm recorded exactly how I sound performing, and of course being part of my program at NYU was when just things exploded for me because remember when I told you about that dream where all I wanted to do was just be in a big recording studio recording all my songs, mm -hmm. I finally got to do that. Right. I got to be in a program for four years where I could have access to the top notch equipment, you know, sound boards you know, uh, you know, 20 different guitars that I get to choose from, you know, microphones that, you know, and, you know, I, I was, I was like in a can, I was in a candy store, honestly. And I was able to work on my craft 24 seven at my program and, and work in a recording studio, you know, like I saw my idols do, like I saw the Beatles do, like I saw, you know, and that's when, you know, I, I knew that I had so much more to learn and, and it led me here where, I have the best of both worlds where I know how to function at a recording studio, but also it was that time early on doing the trial and error, working with smaller amounts of equipment to make the best sound and, and the best of both worlds of being at home and recording at home and being in a studio. I feel like that, that it's a, it's a good marriage for me right now. Mm -hmm. Songwriting wise, you know, the only thing I could say about my journey for songwriting is that the more that I opened myself up to different influences and different genres and the more that I wrote was this how you know, how I became stronger and stronger as a songwriter. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'd safe in saying that every song that I've recorded so far and every song that I've written so far, I could say, wow, this is actually kind of better than the one I wrote before. And that's a really great path to be on. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my journey so far. Yeah. Awesome. That, that's so fun. I, I think uh, it's funny hearing your journey reminds me of my own, reminds me of people, some other people I know, but yours is the only one I've heard so far that's really in this more modern era, right? So like you were doing it with computers mm -hmm. and uh, like a camera and, uh, and then recording your drums with 
moving a MacBook around. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I remember that you're, it's, it seems like you're, you're much more of a producer, recording engineer than I am, although, but I've had quite a bit of that experience too. Mm -hmm. um, and the very first time I recorded myself was similar to your story. It was the blizzard of 96. Mm -hmm. I wrote a song called Dark Winter. Oh, wow. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite a song. And um, I had these tracks in my head and all I had was something called a Singalodeon uh, karaoke machine. Mm -hmm. So with that, I basically, I recorded and, and some microphones and general stuff for a band. I recorded myself singing the song. Then I played it back, I guess loud or something. I don't remember what, and, and I played to it. So in the one uh, deck, I played the song. And then mm -hmm. the other one I recorded myself singing to it and then I did, did it again with the drums so it was a similar thing and of course it sounds pretty pretty bad but it does sound like a band right yeah. on on some level and uh, so I can relate to that and then we would we would try to get sounds with drums or whatever and but uh, we would be moving mics around and then someone would be in another room where everything led back into like a desktop computer so that, that was kind of the, the difference in the era, I guess. But um, so by the way, uh, Paul Senti says, uh, yes, I think that was after saying, let's meet up. So maybe in this thread here on the Facebook podcast, you guys can connect at some point if you want. Sounds great. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see. Um, yeah, and, oh, and the other thing I want to say was, uh, I really think it was beneficial to you that you didn't have any better equipment than you did. I'm sure that was like a key component because you work with what you had, you got mm -hmm. to a certain level, then you stepped up a little bit. Yeah. You work with what you had. So I think do think that that's really key. I, I never encourage people to get very good equipment too soon, you know? Yeah, of course. Because then when you got to that point in college and all this great stuff, you were like, you really appreciated it and you really knew, knew your stuff already. And then yeah. you were ready to learn that much more. Well, you know, I think that what what separated me from, let's say, some some other kids that were a little more technologically, let's say, um, they had more at their disposal, was that I developed more as a musician, let's say, because that's that was my main focus. So, you know, you got to be able to, you know, you can make something sound super good recording wise, you know, if you could record a piano or a drums, but you got to have the chops. And you got to have, you know, you got to be great at the instrument itself in order for to really get the perfect sound that you want, you know. Yeah. So that was I, that one. Yeah, I want to just comment on that real quick. Uh, one, when I was kind of getting into recording, so I, I, I've for a couple of years now I've been recording myself and releasing it. I always did a mix of that with some friends helping, but yeah. I'm finally able to do it by my own now, mm -hmm. uh, willing to. Anyway, and I was asking advice for some friend. Uh, who you may have met, he, he worked at Brooklyn Music House uh, years ago, named Nemanja. I don't know, he was a guitar teacher. Anyway, he's, I'm still friends with him. And he, uh, I was like, how do you, you know, ask him about picking his brain about recording because he has more experience with that than I do. And he goes, the most important thing is to really practice the song first. <laughs> yeah. So then you nail it when you do it because you, you, can't, you can't polish crap, right? So yeah. You can't make something that sounds bad sound good and i just it of course i knew that but i really forgot because of the you know the digital age so much should become so different i forgot how important it is to actually practice the song yeah you know which which i i'm sure you you know about well i think that you know that brings up for me that there really is as a recording artist you know it's it's very different from being a performer in that performer you practice one shot and you're done. Whatever whatever mistakes you made, you have to incorporate in the performance. But when you're recording, number one, like you said, most of the time, nine of the ten times, you are usually just doing one quick rehearsal and then you're you're off. You know, you're you're recording it. You know, a lot of people that's how it is. You know, they don't rehearse as much for a recording session. But the problem with that is that there's so much pressure when you're recording because you know it's concrete you know that this is, there's, there's no, there's, there's, you can do it over if you needed to. And there's a problem with that because 
you're just going to keep doing takes and takes and takes, especially if you're messing up and you haven't practiced it. You're just going to be just keep going at it until you you find the perfect you find the perfect one. And I think that's really arduous. I'd say it's like one of the things that's a challenge as a as a as a producer and recording artist is being able to kind of edit yourself, especially nowadays where you know usually you'd have a song, you'd have a sound engineer, you know, in the most traditional sense of a studio. But nowadays, if your studio's at home and you're the producer and the artist, you need to know how to edit yourself. You need to be able to step back and say, okay, this vocal take was better than, you know, I don't have to do 10 vocal takes for, for, you know, for the same song. I could, I could do three and say, this is my best stuff and then take it from there. And of course, practice before you record. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm definitely of the school of, uh, taking three rather than 10. Um, always feeling like the, the clock is uh, because having, you know, various responsibilities and stuff and just wanting, knowing that finishing is better than, than not finishing basically, right? Finishing something is better than put it, releasing nothing. Of course. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, Paul is, uh, Paul sent these making a comment to uh, one of his old bandmates. Uh, who's also on this podcast, um, Lonnie. Uh -huh. um, so he's uh, cracking a joke, yeah. Uh, so I understand that um, you've studied music at the Clive Davis Institute and uh, at NYU. What was your main focus there? So like, was there, you would tell me a, a little bit about it, but was, it, was there a particular major name that, that you had? Uh, like uh, when I went to school, I, I studied, um, I had a, my degree was in uh, music composition. So my major was music composition. What was your major, if there was one? So uh, number one, it's, it's, it's a bachelor in fine arts. And I think that just the major itself is called recorded music. And I'd say my focus was, to answer your question, it was music production and performance. What was the beauty about my program, and you know, I'll, I'll dive into my experience a little bit about it, is that it was so diverse in what you could learn. You know, you learned whether you came in as a producer, whether you came in as uh, just a straight up musician, whether you came in as a music journalist or, you know, or uh, you want to be a music marketer. And there were so many people, you had to learn everything. You had to learn it. So the first two years of the program was you had to take music marketing. You had to take uh, producing the record. You had to take engineering the record. Uh, you know, you had to take uh, music history classes, specifically even pop history classes, which I felt like was just mind blowing because that's so important. You know, music in the past 50 to 100 years in America is so important to learn about. Um, we all had to take those classes for the first two years, no matter what your study was. Then the, the last two years, they said, OK, now go on your own path choose classes that you feel are down your, you know, that are, that are, you know, up your alley. And, you know, that's where I took, you know, more advanced music production classes. I took more advanced performing classes. Um, of course, I tried to take like music contracts, you know, just so I'm covered on all those areas. But that was the beauty of my program was that, you know, I was able to learn, you know, of course, obviously music theory as well, you know, composition, super important. Um, so all those things came together and, to, and, and, and really widened my view of, of the music industry, which was really important to do. But in, once again, to get back on your question, you know, I loved my time at the, at the program and my time in college. And I, I kind of talked a little bit about it, you know, when I was talking about my journey as a record, you know, recording my music. My dream was to just be able to whenever I wanted 24 seven to hop into a recording studio and just record my music. And I got to do that. And I got to do it in, you know, one of the most technologically advanced studios in Brooklyn. Um, you know, they were very well funded and it, it was such a great, it was such a great thing. And what was very important about my program, I think, and the challenges that I faced was that, you know, obviously I had to audition for this program. And I had to submit, you know, my portfolio of my artwork, my music, you know, I had to stay, I had to do a video of, uh, you know, of uh, a video interview as well. Everybody, there were students from all over the country, all over the world that came to this program, not just me, that were super, super talented. And 
it was the first time where I was able to, you know, look at my peers and say, oh my God, you know, I was super humbled. Oh my God, I have so much to learn. You know, I have so much to do. I have so much work to do if I want to be on the levels of, because obviously you're always going to be comparing yourself to other people, you know, especially in that, in that kind of thing. And I think that one of the, the challenges was being able to find the balance between, you know, unhealthy comparison, but also healthy competition, because, you know, we'd have pr production classes where somebody would play their song and then we'd go move on to my song. The problem is, you know, what if that guy had like fatter drums than I did or better compression? You know, it, it was clear. It was clear as day on what I needed to work on. And it was so important to my development and it forced me to improve. But once again, like it was exactly what I wanted. I, you know, I was in the studio from 9 a.m. to 1, 1, 1 a.m. And, you know, start, you know, I started over, you know, five days a week. It was really great. And, you know, I loved, I loved every bit of it. Man, that, that does sound like a, a dream come true in a way. And it's so, it's so great. I think that you were able to enjoy the school part, right? You know, I think a lot of people might focus on the dream of the success beyond that. But you said what I, what I, what you achieved in school was so great. You know, it's great. You know, I'm at the age of 40 now, I have to say it, it's all about the journey. So enjoying every step of the journey, because all you ever get is the journey, whatever you accomplish, it's, it's a memory, you know? And so it's all about enjoying what, what's right here, right now. So it seems like you're really able, you've been able to do that and, and continue yeah. to enjoy where you are along the journey. A friend of mine went to a, a school called Full Sail. Have, have you heard of that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Then I think Full Sail, I believe, is actually one of the top recorded music schools, I think. I, I'm, I could be wrong on that. But I remember, like, applying. Uh, I remember applying. I think Full Scale was on that list. Um, mm -hmm. It was, you know, it, like I said, this was a very unique program. And it's something that I, it couldn't have been better because, you know, we... we we, you know, around, around the time that you were my, my piano teacher, you know, we were performing, we were having fun, but, you know, I was just doing anything that involved music at the, you know, when I was, you know, when I was a kid, even in high school, I was in both the music, the, the theater program, as well as like the actual music program where, you know, you know, you're on, you're in an orchestra or the band. So there was like these kind of two polar opposites of doing straight up performing, you know, in drama but there was also doing like straight up, you know, sight reading and, and such that I had to do it, you know, and, and then when it came time to apply for high school, I, I was like, I had, I had to choose between these two worlds. But in finding this program, as well as, you know, let's say looking into Full Sail and, and all these other programs that, that did recorded music and, and focused on the music industry, I found like the perfect package of what, what my musicality has been all about all this time. And it, it was, it was perfect. And it was, and it was, it was something that, you know, it, it was a leap of faith, especially when, you know, going into college and, 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 and investing time and investing, you know, uh, college tuition on, 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 you know, my passion and what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you describe the program to me, I'm like, man, that sounds pretty uh, f flexible with a good measure of strictness, you know, like it, certain core things you got to learn. And then yeah, the second half of it, you can kind of choose what you prefer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My experience at Brooklyn college conservatory music was definitely less flexible. And I just kind of took a lot of extra classes I didn't need because I want to get in those ones that I was interested in, you know? Yeah. But there wasn't the access to the studio on the level that you're, you're talking about, or it's quite different, but I did have some, Along my journey, I've had quite incredible experiences in studios and all that. But yeah. so glad, you know, that that's available to people. And it sounds like you really had to work hard for it to get there. Yeah. And then, and then once you were there, you had to work hard as well. Even harder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But uh, but that it, for you, it was just a good, really good match for your personality and your what's yeah. important to you. So. Uh, that's great that that existed. I, I'd never heard of that program. So, is it new? Is it like within the last well, no, 10, they, 20 they, years? Yeah, actually, you're right. In the past 10, 20 years, of course, they've developed. Um, you know, all the professors that they have there, you know, 
are in the music industry themselves. They have like positions outside of just being a professor. You know, uh, you know, a lot of really great producers. Um, and uh, and uh, it it developed it. Obviously, the program itself developed through time, you know, um, and it got even better and better. It even got better and better through my time there where, you know, we used to be in Manhattan with, you know, only three recording studios to work with. Then we moved to Brooklyn and they had like five recording studios, you know, a renovated building for us. You know, it, it was, it was a bit, it, it was really great. And, um, man, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no question in particular. Just, uh, kind of reflecting. Oh yeah. Um, that, uh, cause I, I don't think I, I think I would have heard of it when I was considering college, but I didn't, uh, because it didn't exist probably. I went I went to college in 98. So maybe, I don't know if it was around then, but it yeah. uh, sounds like it might not have been. But of course, I didn't like explore every, everything uh, possible. But at that time, it was like Manhattan School of Music. Uh, what's the other? Juilliard, right? Those are the, the things that, that I was hearing about. And Queens has a good music school, as far as I know. But uh, I ended up in Brooklyn College and no regrets. It worked out really well for me. No, yeah. You know, I I had a lot of performance friends that also went to Brooklyn College. And, uh, you know, I I try to be careful about talking about my college experience, because obviously, like, NYU has, uh, you know, sometimes when you say, oh, I went to NYU, oh, I went to this program where I had all this great equipment, and it was well funded and everything. Sometimes it could sound a little like, uh, like you're a little, uh, what do you call, like, uh, like, you're like, you're boasting a little bit. I don't know if that's the right word, but you're kind of like gloating about your experiences that's like far from it you know i think that what was funny was that you know next to nyu was this this college called the new school which also had a super great music program and it was like much smaller than nyu but yet the best you know the best collaborations that i had musically was connecting with those new school people you know it's not about the education education is the important is, is important but what was more important about everybody's college experience is the people that you connect with and the, the experiences of what, what, what you latch on to. Because everybody's learning experiences is different. And I'm sure that, you know, if I went to any other college program, maybe I would have picked up these things along the way when it came to like developing my music and recording my music. But I think that I was very lucky to, to have a really, really great package. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely get what you're saying where you know, you never know where someone's at and they might feel like, oh, you're one of the lucky ones or something, but, but yeah, you just took it for what it was. You worked for it and then you enjoyed it and made the most of it. Yeah. For me, uh, Brooklyn college was fine for me. And then I did meet so many musicians and, uh, I, I, my second album it's called cornucopia has, uh, eight, I think eight musicians on it besides mm-hmm. me and, uh, all, friends I met from Brook, through Brooklyn College Conservatory. So nice. Yeah, that's real. And international, some of them are in different countries now, you know, so I'm glad I had that. So um, how has your tastes and perspectives relating to music shifted and evolved over the years? Yeah. Uh, to answer that question, going back to uh, recorded music specifically, I, I, if you recall what I said, I said that my major goal for the longest time was taking the music that I performed and, you know, putting it digitally, recording it and making it sound just like the live performance. That was my goal for, you know, the longest time. And naturally so, because I was limited in my technology. So that was what I was chasing after. Um, that I'd say was the start of my, of like my first perspective in music and specifically recorded music. But then I noticed something, especially being within my program was that, and even you said it a little bit, something I'm still working on. My music seemed almost a little too polished and a little too safe in its arrangement. Because once again, I'm all about piano, guitar, drums, and bass, you know, the, 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 the essentials of what most contemporary music is about but you can't ignore the fact that music, especially contemporary music, especially pop music has really evolved beyond that. And not so much in the change in instrumentation, but also the change in approach in that you, you, 
when you're recording music, you're not necessarily searching for perfection. If you search for perfection, you're not going to find art and, you're, and it's not going to be art. And I really don't consider a lot of the stuff that I did, like my, my, my even like my early college stuff, I don't consider like my artwork because I was still in that moment where I was like, wow, I'm in a recording studio. Let me just record everything clean and, and it'll sound like like me live. But then, you know, I started to learn from my my peers and my my professors that recorded music. And especially when you have, you know, you're, you're in the recording studio, you need to be able to embrace the imperfections and embrace kind of like the the little the little nuances of of, you know, your musical performance, your character, your personality and really make something original and special. If you're going to record a piano, you know. I've learned that you can't just record straight up a piano. You got to make sure that you've got it, you know, you, you've got it compressed really good. You've got it, you know, you sounding unique. It has its own character. Um, you know, same thing with drums and, and everything else. And that's something I feel like when it comes to changing perspectives, that's what I feel like what's been my big major change in perspective in music in the past couple of years. And that, especially now that I'm releasing more music and producing my own music, uh, I've learned that people don't want to hear perfection. People want to hear, you know, something unique. They want to hear a certain soundscape that's original to you. And, you know, I try my best to provide that. And that's what really singles out the best recording artists nowadays. Um, you know, I, I remember, I remember specifically George Martin, the producer of the Beatles, I read his biography and he said that he was never a stickler about tuning instruments because if one thing was out of tune, that made it that that made it stand out in the in the arrangement, and you could be able to single it out. And it was interesting as a listener to hear it. That's one example, but you understand what I'm saying in like the switch in perspective and in, in music, and that you just got to people want to hear a human being, you know, in in their in, in the music that they listen to, and you know that's what I'm that's what I'm striving for with my new perspective in music. Cool, cool. Uh... I have some comments on that. Uh, Darlene says, uh, pretentious, but you're not. So I guess she was trying to fill in the word you said. What's the word? And um, talking about, you know, when you speak about your college experience, she says, you're not that, but that's the word you were looking for, I guess. Oh, great. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's a, it's a song title there, pretentious, but you're not. Sounds like or, or, where's, my, where's my pen? All right. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Wait, but I might I might have to pay the person who came. Who who is that? Uh, Darlene Carney. <laughs> Darlene, I'm putting it down. Okay. If I write a song, I promise I'll, I'll put some royalties on it. It's okay. Yeah. Or at least I'll dedicate it to her or something. Yeah, I'll dedicate it. <laughs> She'll be happy with that, I think. Um yeah. So um, right. As as a recording artist myself, I, I come from the school of uh and it's not from a school that was like, it wasn't that I was surrounded in, it was just what I magnetized to, um, which is more like Bob Dylan, singer song, Pete Seeger, if you know who that is, uh, like a really yeah. traditional folk guy. Um, yeah. And because what I learned at some point in my college career, I learned that American music, the history of music, like some of these great songs that were only recorded with like the most basic of recording equipment on someone's porch yeah. in the South, you know, with a guy traveling around to just capture it. Yeah. So the songs would, would live. So I was always okay with very rough recordings. And when, when they got a little more polished, I was like, okay, great. You know, so for me, the journey was um, more about releasing as much as possible because I just feel like I'm a, a fountain of music, not to say it's, it's all good music, but it just keeps coming. So for me, polishing something really good isn't uh, too natural to me because yeah. I don't, I just don't care enough. You know, I'm like, eh, get it, go, go, get it out next. And then there's always so much coming. It's kind of like being, having a poop, you know, it's like, just get it out. I just rather get it out. You know, <laughs> I don't want it to be stuck in me, you know? Aye, aye, aye. So that that's kind of how I am, am as an artist that like, I regard myself as an apple tree, really. Yeah. Like I'm in a field. I produce apples seasonally. Come and take them. You know, I don't, they, they might be good apples. Some might not taste so great. But yeah. You can rely on me to produce apples. The, if you want apples, I'm a tree. I'm an apple tree. You know, like that's kind of how I see myself. And 
never too concerned with it being too in time. And I mean, now everything's metronomic, but as I was younger, the timing or the tuning, I could live with it. Like you said, it's, it's really about the character. I, I didn't know that about uh, George Martin, but it makes sense. A lot of Beatles stuff, certainly the sixties in general, didn't sound that in tune, you know, they didn't have uh, snark tuners, of course, around that time, yeah. but uh, it, it makes sense. I, I don't, I'm, I've come to realize personally that uh, what it, what is, what does in tune even mean? You know, it, it was just a concept and uh, on a, some level, you know, like to detune something a little bit might be a sound that some, someone or many people are attracted to. I do it. I do. I do it all the time. You know, like I said on my pianos, I like to detune a little bit because it kind of gives it that kind of like old folky sound, kind of like how my first piano sounded. You know, I, I remember one tuner that I had called my piano a toy, which it probably was maybe my first piano, but it had such a unique sound to it. But like I could, John, I could really relate to what you're saying, because when it comes to like, just get it out, just release it, you know, get, don't don't spend too much time on the song. You know, there, there are so many songs that I've had on the back burner that I've overcooked too much that now it's like, I don't know what to do with it because you got to be careful with the amount of connection and the kind of emotional connection that you, and the obsession that you have with your work that, you know, it's not going to be perfect. And it, it definitely is something as a, as a, either a musician a recording artist, a producer, a performer, you have to know, you have to put yourself on a schedule and know, you know, when, how much time you need to work on your music and work on a particular song. It's, it's super important. Yeah. To have that like off switch, right. Or like, okay, done. You know, this is as good as it could get better. It could get worse. Who knows? This is this time. Yeah. It, there's a, there's a guy named Seth Godin. Have you ever heard of him? I uh, know. Seth Godin is kind of regarded as this marketing genius. He's got a lot of books. Um, most people like him. I, I've read a few of his books, but one, one concept I really appreciate of his is uh, ship. It is, it's like he, this concept of ship. And what it means is just whatever your product is, if, if it's music or if it's any other industry, yeah, it just ship. It, it's more about how frequently we ship. Of course, you don't ship pure garbage, but yeah. ship some, you know, if you, if you think it has potential, it could, be, it could be 1.0, that could be a 3.0, 5.0, just to not release things, especially at the pace of how frequently things are being released in our world is like a missed up. It's kind of missing the, the point, you know, and, and as, a, as a writer too, cause I got into writing, I'm, I'm working on books. I was learning in the Kindle world, Kindle books, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's much more preferable to uh, be successful, I suppose, or make a career out of it is if you write like a hundred page books, write five of them, instead of like your long magnum opus, your excellent, amazing fiction novel of 500 pages, because nobody's gonna read 500 page book nowadays. And the, that long, length of time that's gonna to take to put it out yeah. is, is, is gonna prevent you from missing many opportunities, um, you know, that come along the way with people just, you know, creating a relationship with you, the author, or in this case, the artist. Mm -hmm. So, which is, I understand why you like to really singles it is like a singles world right now we were talking about that and yeah you asked me like if i had an album coming and you know every every year or two i'm like okay i'm gonna make an album because i have the compilation but yeah like you, you got to be also responsible about your music and and how you know that the the consumer is going to be able to process it uh you know if you don't have the reputation to to make an album unless it truly needs to be an album that it's a concept kind of album you know, re release it as a single, especially nowadays where, you know, a lot of artists and brands need to have social media. You want to stagger your content so you could have, you know, you're not just do putting out an album and then you're gone for three years and then you come back with another one. You want to you want to be able to release music and have people enjoy it, you know, on a more consistent basis. But also, John, just to just to be the devil's advocate in what we're talking about, I do think that there is an importance in stepping away from from your songs as well and giving it time and the reason why i say that is that you know there are times where i have overcooked my songs but there's one song that i'm that i particularly i'm working on right now where i started uh like maybe two months ago in the start of the summer and you know it, it was a great song it had great lyrics and it had great chords but it had problems both production key wise songwriting wise and i had to make a decision that 
I can't rush this. Let me put this aside and let me come back to it. And, you know, just, you know, just like that, when I came back to it, you know, I, I maybe I came back to it like two or three times. I put it down and then put it back again. I worked those problems out just by stepping away and coming in with a different perspective. And now like it's a, a much stronger song than how it started out. So I think, you know, once again, for me, all roads lead back to the Beatles. They were the masters of, you know, quality versus quantity. They, they released music like nobody's ever released music before. And the amount of songs they've written. There were times like you could say in like the White Album or Sgt. Pepper where they truly had songs that they were attached to that they gave a lot of work to. But they also had songs where they were like, here it is, one session, send it out, release it and enjoy it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 journey, you know. So you know, and and also the error plays into it so much. You know what the reality of recording is in the '60s versus uh, my era and versus now. What, what we're both in together now, um, which I could, you know, it's like the era of your generation. Mm -hmm. um, just to throw it out there as a just a perspective thing. So the way uh, I put out a few albums. Uh, in a very like album way, it's a new thing, and I release it, and here's a, bu a bunch of songs. Like I said, because I'm this just uh, I'm a prolific writer, and that's not a compliment to myself. It just it just comes out easy. It doesn't mean it's a lot of good stuff. It just comes out, you know. Sometimes, John, John you are a pro prolific writer. Okay, don't <laughs> don't don't be humble about it. You are. Go ahead, <laughs> go ahead, go on. Right. So, so like, like I said, it keeps coming out. So it's like, if I'm an apple tree, I got all these apples. It's, it's really sad if I don't, if I just pick one and polish it, you know, like just put, put 12 of them in there and give them away. You know, it's like yeah. put all my album, my songs on an album or the, or the best of a group and put them out there. So I did that twice when I was younger Then 2008, the, the album with that has love dinosaur on it. I did that. That was my third official album kind of which i never even officially released i plan on doing it this year and then uh but then recently i've been going back in my archives i did a lot of archival recording that never did release i worked it out with the people with the friends that i recorded it with mm -hmm. and i've been putting out i put out one two three of these since 2019 i put out three albums that are just like archival recordings that were just sitting there yeah so if i don't release them i'm I just rather just throw it out and I couldn't throw it out. So I said, if I'm keeping it, I want to share it. And then I polished it enough. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then I packaged it with, with the cover. Um, I, I, one of them, I even two of them, I made actually hard copy CDs too. Yeah. So it's just for me, that's, I'd rather leave a record of my existence of my, of my artwork. Yeah. Uh, over building myself as a, you know, uh, an artist that people are gonna flock to it, for, for me it just doesn't matter so much you know yeah. if people like it they like it i'm going to keep creating it mm -hmm. and of course there will be people who like it but it's not the most sensible or you know by no means the the, the recommended way to release things but that's how i go about it you know well you know i, I might just take a, a page out of your book because like i'm the same way i do have like so much stuff you know in the archives that I would love to just get out there because it, it serves a purpose somewhere, you know, and, and it's not everything's going to be perfect. And, you know, even in my program, there were, you know, there were, you know, colleagues that I had that were releasing music on certain sites, like they were releasing music on more, uh, let's say, underground sites or like experimental sites like SoundCloud rather than full on Spotify and Apple Music, because they were kind of waiting to see, you know, what the, you know, what the best time to release is. And, you know, in my mind, I'm like, you know, if I'm recording something, if I'm, if I'm writing something, I'm going to release it right now. Cause this is what represents me at this time in this era. And mm -hmm. if you know, you're going to, you're always going to, I guess everybody has that fear of what's your, what's your, your ninth symphony, what's your ninth symphony going to be, you know, you're always mm -hmm. going to be uh, comparing yourself to, you know, what's your best song going to end up being. And, and when, when's my peak going to be as an artist, when have I reached my best work? And you got to just make sure that you just keep cementing the music that you're writing now in this time period. And then you just keep moving on and writing songs that represent, you know, your future you, you know, you don't want to release stuff that represented your past you, you know, that, that, that could be, 
You know, we're, we're, yeah. as, an, as artists, both of us, as artists, we change and our perspectives change. And of course, our music changed. You said it yourself. You needed to polish the stuff that, you, that you've archived because you were a different person. I'm the same way. You know, my production style has changed and gotten better. And, you know, if you're going to release older stuff, just know that, you know, you're going to have that responsibility to polish it up because you've improved as, as a person naturally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I would also add to that, when I say polish it up, basically I meant um, mastering. And it did involve a little bit of, uh, no, it, well, it didn't involve mixing because I didn't have any tracks. I just only had uh, finished recordings, mm -hmm. but I just want to master it so that I, I'm, I really like listening to albums. So that's, I enjoy listening to albums. I'm not yeah. really, a, I am, I do playlists sometimes, but I'd rather just find an album and put it on. And uh, it's important to me that the album has a consistent mood. Yeah. So when I create an album, I always look for that. And I try to make it so that the volumes are pretty similar. Mm -hmm. The overall EQ, even if they weren't recorded together, somehow, uh, if you listen from one to the other, it doesn't like jolt you like, oh, that doesn't feel right. It's like, okay the song sounds like a good one for, to follow the last. And yeah. it's fun to put them together. Like the, the last few I did had eight songs each and uh, to, to get that order, memorize it, play around like, no, no, that song shouldn't be number two. That should be number seven, you know? And then you figure that out and there's a story, whether it's like a clear story or just like a very rough idea of something that people could use their imagination for. I don't know. It, it's a good, it's a good experience. If you have a lot of archival stuff, I recommend it as something to consider down the line, you know? Of course. Yeah. And by the way, uh, are you familiar with CD baby? I'm not sure who your distributor is. Or it I'm is, not promoting it is them, but maybe. It, it is maybe. Yeah. Oh, cool. So do you know that the, um, the, the conference is coming up in August? The CD oh. baby. Yeah. The CD baby DIY conference. It's going to be virtual this year. Um, so it's it's free actually if you're a CD baby. What goes on so. at these conferences? What goes on at these conferences? Uh, lots of classes, lots of learning. YouTube will come and give a lecture. Um, Spotify will give a lecture. Uh, people who are maybe doing song, uh, doing music for film will come yeah. and you learn how to get into that and, and uh, pitching songs, uh, how to use Instagram and Facebook most effectively, ads and whatever the changing marketplace is, like I went to a CD Baby conference in Austin, uh, 2019, and then in uh, 2017 in, in Nashville. And they were just really rich. Uh, when you talk about your college experience, remind me a little bit of that, like just around a lot of healthy, competitive energy, yeah. you know, like young, uh, not necessarily young, a lot of we were young, some were older. Uh, people, DIY guys, you're a DIY guy, you know, and I definitely recommend going to it, especially if you're a uh, belong to CD Baby already. I definitely would love to do that. You know, I, I've taken every opportunity to continue to learn, and, and that would be really great. I hope, I hope that they do. They eventually do one in person too. That would be really great. Now that we're talking about CD Baby, honestly, and 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 we've talked about Spotify too. I think going back to like the perspectives in music, I think that. It, I come from a very special generation where I've had two different worlds when it comes to music, when it's come, when it, when it came to music. Cause when, you know, when I was 10 years old and I started really appreciating music, that was the time of, you know, iPods were the thing, you know, uh, music, each song costed 99 cents on iTunes. That was the main thing. You were on iTunes and you bought the music you like, and you paid a, a, a single price for each individual unit that you bought. And with that, you know, your 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 musical uh, what do you call it? your musical collection was very limited, and your and even your your uh, your influences and 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 what you were capable of of listening to was very limited because it had a, an economic price to it based on how many songs you bought and listened to. And of course, the same thing goes for like a CD or a record. You know, there's nothing different. That was just, but still even though it was digital, it was a concrete product that you bought every time. And at that time, I said to myself, oh my God, like if I could release my music to, for everybody to, to see and hear, that would be like, that would be heaven on earth. You know, it didn't occur to me that I would be able to, unless I was signed by a record label, that I would have had music released that anybody could hear. Now jump to 2021, where you have music streaming with Spotify and Apple Music, where you either 
listen to advertisements or you pay the premium and you could listen to anything you wanted, mm -hmm. anytime you want, any amount of song. You want to listen to a song, you look it up and you find it and you and you and you expand, you know, your 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 music, you know, your musical influences in a way that you, you weren't really able to do so much unless it was an ex, it was an expense back then. And the same thing with CD Baby, like now I can release music without being attached to a record label. I can release music and 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 have it showcased on a platform that's the same as as you know the big the, the, the big people upstairs you know like you know the, the the main people that are on the charts that's something truly special and you know you could you could talk about the comparisons on how saturated the market is because of that now but i think that the doors flew wide open and i'm so glad that i was being i was part of a you know as a part of time in music history where that was able to happen yeah, I think it really leveled the playing field in a lot of ways. And what I discovered at these conferences and being with CD Baby for a number of years now is it's really up to each each uh, person's efforts. You know, if you work hard, you work, I guess, smart uh, or, or the way that's most natural to you. And, and you just keep on showing up authentically and, uh, you know, being uh, your real self, but but doing the work, um, yeah. you can you can generate you'll you hear a lot of cool experiences of people that have made a career and like, I don't know if they spoke about this at the school you went to, but some people, if you have like, I don't know, 10,000 fans or like, even if it's a thousand true fans or something that you could have a career, like it, it's much more attainable yeah. a career music, uh, even as an artist than, than it used to be, but you might have to be really flexible and be willing to shift gears and, you know, not do a prescribed path like write an album tour write an album tour do interviews it, it's that world is not really existing anymore but yeah but like you said the opportunities for being in the music business are vast yeah yeah um yeah i do think it's a very precious time that we live in yeah i do encourage you to check that out um i'll, I'll send you the link later you can easily find it but and anyone out there who's listening who doesn't know about CD Baby and if it's before August 26th, I think, I think it's 26th to 28th, uh, check it out, the DIY Music Conference. There's a lot to learn there as uh, DIY musicians. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us about one of the, tell us any uh, or one of the great lessons you've learned along your journey that helps you to remain positive, upbeat, moving forward? Yeah. Well, you know, it's a really good trans transition that we just talked about CD Baby and, and how, you know, how there's so many artists out there and how there's so many people that are looking to build a following and a brand using their music and try to influence people. And I think that nowadays, because it's not just, you know, Spotify and CD Baby, it also has to do with utilizing Instagram, Facebook, and all the social media outlets. Things can get pretty negative pretty quickly if you're comparing yourselves to other people you know unfortunately i think one of the things that artists have to really deal with nowadays is that you need to be part of this social media world whether you like it or not you need to have your stuff out there you need to be performing content if you truly want to reach people you know and, and gain a following nowadays and even like, I remember having a publicist turn me down because I didn't have the social media numbers. You know, I've had, I've had to work on that. Um, social media, is, you know, is important for an artist. But what's a big thing is that nowadays, if you have a social media account, you have a brand. Everybody has a brand on social media. And, and sometimes things can get pretty fake. Sometimes things can get pretty plastic. And you have to just make sure that one of the things I've had to learn, especially with, you know, like I said, all the healthy competition being at my program and, 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 and working towards building a brand and, and being a performer and, and having a voice online is that you need to make sure that you be careful how you compare yourself to others. Make sure that if you're on your path to your, you know, you're on a path and either whether it's music or anything else, you know, you have to have the blinders on and focus on your own, um, your own, uh, your own path. And, and building your own path and, and understanding that 
yes, you look to other people because you want to be inspired. You want to uh, learn new things from other people and learn their perspectives. But you have to know that you can't feel insecure about where other people are, even if they're ahead of you. You have to know that you're on your own path. So, and that's really hard to do nowadays with social media. It's, it's really one of the hardest things. And it's definitely something that for the longest time, and even nowadays still, I've had those moments where you could feel very insignificant if you, if you look in the wrong places of social media. You know, you need to make sure that you stick to what's concrete. You stick to what's flesh and blood rather than just ones and zeros on a computer. You know, it's very important. And I, th that's one of the things that I keep telling myself. And that's one of those lessons that I say, you know, you could, you know, it's great to, you know, have, you know, a thousand likes on a video, but what's even greater is when somebody comes up to you after a performance and said, you've changed my life. This is important. You inspired me, you know, and I've had those moments too. And those moments are way more important than the moments where, you know, you get a dopamine hit online. You know what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say? Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad you uh, very clearly said that coming from, again, a, a younger person. Uh, I think it's important for young people to hear it and to know it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly an advocate of uh, flesh and blood over uh, digital numbers and stuff like that. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, spending time with my son or, or my, my friends, my real in person or, my, or with my neighbors, you know, yeah. Uh, that's got to be a part of my day, you know, and then I do what I sort of need to do online just because I feel like I have gifts to give and share. And yeah. like you said, this is the, the world we live in. We kind of, if we want to have our art reverberating in the world, participating in social media is probably going to be involved, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, the comparison, comparing to other other people is uh, truly um, something to overcome. There, I can go real deep in many directions with that, but uh, yeah, like the big why, right? What's your why? Yeah, of course. You know, to to come back to that, to have maybe put that on a wall, right, or whatever you got to do. A lot of times, you know, I, I'm a, I practice Buddhism and I chant every day, and mm -hmm. sometimes I wake up in the morning, I feel like crap, and I'm just like. While well, I'm chanting, just trying to think, you know, what the heck? I, I, too many things I have to do, or, or I feel I don't have enough time to do things that are important to me, or comparing myself in life. Mm -hmm. It's less now, I have to say. At, at my age, it's comparing has become less, fortunately, but mm -hmm. um, still, you know, it happens. And just being frustrated where I am, maybe. And um, the why, you know, the why is very simple. It comes back to this really pure hearted thing, which is I want to be healthy. I want to feel good every day. I want yeah. to contribute my talents in a way that's fair to me. That's very loving to me, you know, like that honors who I am yeah. at the same time to, to, to give my talents generously. That's a gift. Of course, you know, it's a big gift. It is because how rare is that today? Right. Right. To find someone who's actually asked you a question and you answer and they're like, and they listen to you. It's like, you're listening to me? <laughs> like, great. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's so true. And, you know, when I come back to the real, the why, uh, it's very simple, you know. And, and I, yeah, I think one thing that really helped me is realizing, and, and Buddhism helped me with this very much, that um, we are all equal, but truly not, not knowing is a concept, truly feeling it. Yeah. So they, so that means that we're anywhere, wherever anyone is on their path, yeah. if they're ahead of me in some way, or, or like look like they're behind me or lower than me, yeah. none of it is meaningful. Of course. It's all just basically an illusion that I have to operate with, you know, and understand that I'm going to, be the most uh, I'm going to benefit most by regarding each person as a, as an equal. And that, that also means that I have the right to be myself, you mm -hmm. know, and that it, where, wherever I am, my path, I'm, I'm no less worthy than anybody else. And that I could actually contribute to people by just being me, you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, but that I'm really glad you brought that up about uh, not comparing because 
it's crucial. It's so, it's so important. It's so important. Yeah. And I would say, especially for your generation or even younger, I mean, I'm yeah. sure older people are comparing a lot too, but yeah, our, well, at least we had the era where we didn't have to go through that. But now if you grew up with the social media all the time, it must be pretty, could be pretty dense, I guess, and like right in your face. Well, I, I, I hope that I'm not the exception because I think that, you know, my speaking for my generation, I think a lot of us are very much aware of it. And once again, there's only so much that you can do. You know, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't underestimate how great these tools are to have in your life, social media that you connect with people. I mean, like without Facebook, John, like we, uh, how would we have reconnected, you know, and, and, and yeah. stayed, on, stayed on top of what each other were doing, even though we were a great distance apart for so many years. You know, it's all about balance. It really is. Yeah, right. By all means, this this uh, interview is made possible very much by Facebook and by technology. So it, I'm certainly not an advocate of, I'm not anti-technology, even though I wrote a song, song Anti-Machine on my uh, that album from <laughs> 2008. But um, uh, yeah, it's, it's very much about balance. And I, I think... Um, because everything's so slanted heavy towards technology and social media, the yeah. balance kind of has to be a little bit heavy on the other side for now at this point in history in yeah. terms of like really, you know, real life connections. Imagine we had a blackout that lasted for more than a day. Imagine we had a, a two week blackout. That, what was, do we do? I, I, I'm scared to, I'm scared to envision it to be honest. I really am. You know, but I'll tell you what would happen is uh, people would start going fucking outside and talking to their neighbors. Well, that's, oh, that's what would happen right. first. But you think, know? No, wait, I think there'd be a panic point first and then that would happen, you know? Yeah. You know, like we're all, we're all glued to, a lot of us are glued to our screens. Like I'm, 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 I'm guilty of it too. Like I'd go through a period of withdrawals because I think that it, yeah. it, it, the way that social media works is very much like a drug that, you know, mm -hmm. you're getting a certain dopamine hit from it. You know, and once you're starved from it, you're going to have a period where you're going to feel, you know, like, like you're, you're, you're unbalanced and you're going to feel like agitated. Then of course, yes, you're going to, you're going to come sober on it. And I think, you know, yeah, I agree with you on that. Yeah, no, totally. Totally. I mean, it, it, it happened uh, on my block a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, unfortunately a squirrel got zapped, right. And, and an ex a transformer exploded and just everything went out. It was. It wasn't like everyone was pumping the, the air conditioners and went out. I, that's usually what happened in the summer, but it wasn't even that hot. I don't think the air conditioners were on. It was a squirrel, and all of a sudden, within seconds, no, numerous neighbors appear, and then people who don't like ever normally socialize are starting to like feel because it's not coming on for a while. They're like, yeah, maybe I should go and talk to someone, you know. And I, I'm always out talking to my neighbors, so it was no big deal at all. I'm like, yes, more neighbors to talk to, you know? <laughs> but, uh, and not making fun of people. It's just that that is how we're uh, we're living, you know, squirt, you know, not to use the word, uh, hold up, hold up in, in these 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 homes. Uh, when I grew up, um, it, it was, they were, if it was June, if it was July, every single night there'd be kids out on the block until 10, 11 at night, kids yeah. out playing. Not saying that's better, but but it, it's, we've changed a lot. You know, people don't naturally want to go out and socialize yeah. and whatever. That's where we are. I'm not judging it. No, but, uh, yeah. you know. Um, I remember those times too. You know, I, I, I really don't recall. Like I said, once again, it all goes back to kind of having the best of both worlds. And then I was part of that generation that technology, the technology that we had wasn't like fully consuming our lives yet you know right. we had more socialized i remember like just going around my neighborhood with my bike with my friends you know spending late nights in the summer you know and you, you just had your own fun yeah no i i, I agree it's uh it, and then sometimes i feel like me personally i feel like there are kinds of like moments where i feel starved from not really having especially now that you know the pandemic or post pandemic you know it, it, you you feel how starved you are from one-on-one -on -one conversations and how important it is to like even talk to strangers sometimes i mean like mm -hmm. we, we both live in new york city and we know that sometimes it's not the most friendly place when you know you're on the subway 
really <laughs> nobody nobody talks to each other in the subway you know at least at least you know for for nine out of ten times you know the person who's talking on the subway and yapping his mouth you you're like oh you know you're kind of weirded out a little bit but that's because that's kind of the new york city energy the city kind of energy and the energy that we have nowadays but i think like if you go to other parts of the world you know you could see a difference you could see a difference it's also a cultural thing too i think that it, it's it it it's different in, in, in certain pe- periods and certain areas within the world, I'd say too, as well. It's, mm-hmm. it, it is a kind of a New York city energy to kind of minding your business too, as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Like we were just, my family's just in the Catskills and, and, and the Poconos in June. And uh, yeah, people were uh, more friendly there, even though it's still uh, very close to New York city. Um, yeah. And, and I've spent a lot of time, out of, out of the country as well, or, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's, New York City is very unique for sure. Mm-hmm. And, and particularly unique in that coldness, even though most people are quite cool when you get to know them, but oh, yeah. we have this shell that we have to, you know, this armor that we put on most of us. And I hope when I say this, like, and I don't know if I've, I've really stressed this enough within this podcast, because, you know, I, I spoke a lot about my, my time, but like, I absolutely am, in love with New York City. You know, I was born and raised here and I can't see myself both music, both in my personal life and my professional life, I can't see myself anywhere but New York City and Brooklyn in general. I think that what an awesome place to be around. You know, anything you want, you're, you're a block away from. Yeah. Oh yeah, Brooklyn is, for me, I, I really feel, you know, I guess I'm biased, we're biased growing up in Brooklyn, um, but I do feel like Brooklyn and, I've traveled a bit and I believe you've traveled a bit. Yeah. Um, Brooklyn to me feels like, uh, it just feels like this, not the center of the world, but like the home of the world. So wherever I go, it's like, if you say Brooklyn, someone's got a relative that lives there or they've passed through there for some reason, even though it's not a city, right? Technically, when you say the word Brooklyn, they, they know what you're talking about. Usually, you know, it's got its own reputation, its own, uh, magnetism, you know, globally. So, Brooklyn could be its own planet, to be honest. It's so bad. <laughs> I, I mean, like, what's great about Brooklyn is that it is so big that even like, even if I just walk around and get lost in Brooklyn or, or take a new route, I always find something new. I always find something new. I've been here twenty three years, and I, I I still am amazed and 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 learning new things about the place where I live. You know, yeah, I remember saying that, uh, telling that to my wife or other people too. I'm like, I'll I, I'll travel, take a bus somewhere for a new event or something, and go a new neighborhood. I'm like, yeah, I never knew, I never knew any of this existed. Like neighbors, I just never even heard of street names. I never heard of. I took right. just out of just out of coincidence, I hopped on the ferry for the first time, the New York City ferry for the first time, and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> I could have had, like, I've been taking the subway, I've been taking the bus with, you know, you know, most of the time you're just in your seat and you're just staring at like darkness through a tunnel. But for the same price, if you, you have the opportunity, if it's, if it's with your route to take the ferry, to be on a boat and see, and, and, and see the views of the Hudson river mm-hmm. and, you know, with the same price of, of, of the subway. And that's, that blew my mind. And now, like, <laughs> like I said, just, just, just the current, just a current event that I had that, that, that was, uh, that's uh, similar to what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. And I never really even considered that, you know, I, I took the Staten Island ferry one time, but uh, are you, you're talking about like a ferry that goes from Brooklyn to Manhattan? Is that yeah, right? Yeah. Well, I think the Staten Island ferry is, is part of a route where it's Staten Island, it's Bay Ridge to Red Hook to Sunset Park to Dumbo to like, maybe lower east side manhattan i don't know but like right. it, it's it's a, it's a line almost like, like like there's a bus route there's a sub there's a subway route there's a there's a ferry route and it's so much cooler <laughs> wow yeah awesome and, and by the way paul senti says that uh he lives near the poconos now and he loves it so i had, yeah. a, I had a i had a gig in the po- in, in the can skills you know where I, once again i felt that same energy that you did john you know it's it's really great. And of course, you know, New York is definitely more than just the city. It is those parts of upstate New York that I greatly appreciate. You know, those little towns down there, you know, up there, excuse me, you know, uh, 
they, they all have their 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 different energies and their different history you know and it's it's really great it really is yeah i remember just last week in the catskills at nighttime going outside for a walk in this like community i was we were airbnb in the community and walking to the road seven minute walk up to the road looking on the road pitch black couldn't even see a, a house the next house <laughs> it's scary sometimes yeah i'm like wow and and, but, and just like being just outside of what the the actual accommodation just silent just like just hugged hugged by the mountains i love i love the mountains i'm more of a mountain than a beach person yeah you know if it can be anywhere i'd love to be in the mountains well, while, while we're on the topic, actually, and, that, you know, we kind of skewed off topic a little bit for music, but still, like, I, I remember speaking to my, my, my one of my producers slash, you know, my professors who was a producer, like, and, and he said that there's a lot of people that if they had the money, a lot of producers, if they've had the money, instead of investing in a space in New York City, they'll buy a, a, a house in, in, uh, in, in the countryside and build a studio there. And they'll invite artists and they'll invite bands to, to perform their music in the studio that's in the, their, their personal studio in the countryside. Because you're right, there is something about the quietness and the, the change in pace and being away from all that kind of noisy energy that, that make, as, as an artist, it, 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 it's, it, you know, it, it kind of sets your barometer straight and sets it right. And I think that's it. And just, just to, to the point of the, you know, that, yeah. that's what we're talking about. That reminds me of two things. I think, uh, was it the yeah, Zeppelin? I think they like rented a castle or something or like a mansion to do one of their big albums. Yeah. So it kind of was kind of like in the countryside. And I'm sure a lot of artists did that. Um, I had experience, it was 2005 summer. Yeah. With, I was in a band level six and we got invited with this, something called a spec deal to go down to uh, Weed, California, which is Northern California, right near... Um, the whatever Oregon yeah close to there right near Mount Shasta a really famous mountain and uh and the deal was like you we pay basically uh half price or whatever it was and we get to stay there for a week or two whatever it was and uh in this like small town with like right surrounded by nature kind of and uh and then the, the studio was really beautiful we had a lot of space because it's I'm sure the rent was much less there and yeah. then they, they actually rented the theater mm -hmm. there's this old like movie theater next to it which was part of their studio so you can go into this old abandoned movie theater go onto wow. the stage and you can set up your band there and record it to do your like album or your demo or whatever that's that's really cool Super interesting and, wow yeah, especially in a theater in a theater my god <laughs> like yeah. you know every, every recording space could look similar but of course there are like the most famous things like like stacks like that was that was an old movie theater hmm. and you know interesting spaces interesting interesting spaces make interest interesting records you know that's mm -hmm. that was the beauty that was the beauty about the 60s 70s and 80s is that you were recording usually you know you could tell a lot of people if you had the ear for it you could tell what the studio was you could tell by the reverberation you could tell by you know the 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 delay time each each studio was its own character mm -hmm. uh paul senti says attention artists come to my studio in the countryside so i guess he's got a studio in the country <laughs> i'm set Heads I'm up, paul. now someone's coming <laughs> no i'll definitely I'll, I'll i would love to connect and and it would be really great it'd be really cool <laughs> You know, I, this I'm this is this is definitely what this is all about. This podcast, and I think it's 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 been really cool so far. Yeah, absolutely connecting. I have a few more questions if you got the time, Marco. Of course, yeah. yeah. All right, cool. So, do you have a spiritual philosophy that guides and informs what you do and how you live? Hmm. Well, John, I think the best way that I can answer that question um, is that I was very lucky to be. Uh, instilled with some really, really great universal morals that, you know, through my upbringing that, you know, I follow to this day, I followed all my life. Um, and that's, you know, three things, being honest, being humble, and working hard. And, you know, these aren't just empty slogans, you know, these are things that I've noticed with my own character, that these are absolute musts. When I say being honest, of course, I mean, 
you know, don't tell lies. That's, that's the obvious thing. And that's, that's, that's universal. But I also think that being honest on a, on a more macro level is also making sure that when you're presenting yourself to the world, that you're, you know, you're being honest on who you are, which I think that nowadays can be kind of hard to do. Everybody's trying to impress each other one way or another. And then sometimes you could like kind of uh, like mix and match, you know, you know, what you could say to impress people. But I think that sometimes if you just could be as authentic as possible, that's an amount of honesty. That's, that's a very special kind of honesty um, that I really try to strive for. Um, when it comes to being humble, I think that's, that's just a no brainer. But I think that in the, in the perspective that I'm in right now, you know, as a performer, we, we know what it's like to hear applause and, you know, applause can be very rewarding. You know, it could, it could give you kind of a self-assurance. It could be an affirmation, but you also need to understand that you should never do it. For, you should never, especially if you're playing music, don't follow the applause. Don't, that's not the reason why you're doing it. You know, don't, don't, don't chase it. Don't let it control you. You know, don't try to keep, uh, don't search for, you know, recognition and, 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 you know, just empty compliments. Don't search for those, you know, you have to embrace the criticisms and, you know, the, the honest things that people say to you that, you know, you have to embrace that just as much as the compliments and make sure that you, you take those in. You don't lie to yourself about that and you stay humble within it. Uh, working hard. Like I said, the third thing, um, this is something that I'm experiencing right now, you know, it's, um, it's, to me, it's very easy to work hard at something that's mandated. You know, when it, you know, in high school and in college, homework and tests were very concrete things that, okay, I need to study for this. I need to work hard. I need to set a schedule because it's mandated. You know, there's other people on your back about it, but this, there are things in life, including things in music that beyond your job, beyond your school, beyond, you know, your, your daily responsibilities that you need to put time and effort for, you know, if you're going to have, especially a music career, you know, obviously you might need a day job at first, when you have that day job, you can't get off the day job and then just sit on the couch all day and, and, and waste your time that way. If you really want to pursue a passion, you need to make sure that you're responsible for the things that, that other people won't be heckling you for. You need to be responsible for the things that you care about and that you're working hard for the things you care about. And you're setting a schedule for the things you care about. And that's something, like I said, I'm fresh out of college. That's something I'm working towards. So to answer your question, honesty, being humble and working hard are the things that, the philosophies I'd say I'd live by. And like, I think that's the best way to answer it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, honesty, being humble, working hard. Sounds to me very much like a, a immigrants, immigrant parents, uh, like life lessons, fundamental life lessons. I well, if I, didn't, if I didn't mention it, you know, I'm Italian American. My, my mom and my dad were born in Italy and I'm a first generation. So I'm like, I'm glad you picked up on that. It, mm -hmm. I, I agree with you on that. Yeah. That's definitely something I would hear from particular Italian people that I know who either come from Italy or, or the parents that they would say similar things. And they, and knowing this one guy in particular, I could think of who was in his sixties, just like a stand up character. He came over uh, when my friend said I needed help with fixing my uh, bathroom. Cause I, I kind of made, made him a bit of a mess trying to do the right thing, but I, some got messed up and he said, yeah, I'll come over. And he came over, he fixed this big plumbing job, which would have cost $700 if I paid someone to do it. This Italian, he, guy? Italian guy, yeah, Rocco. Uh, and, uh, one thing, one thing, just, sorry, <laughs> one thing that Italians know how to do is fix up a bathroom. <laughs> love, they love that. They love type like, <laughs> yes, I love, I'm glad that I'm so happy. That's a coincidence that you put that that's in your story. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, and he, he came over and he, he took care of it. John, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll got you. I'll help you out here. And and then he, he also added, added a life fixture while he's at it. Like, you know, there's this life fixture. I'm not sure. He's like, ah, give it to me. And then it was it was up. He's like, I didn't have to thank you because I knew he wasn't going to accept money. And he didn't. It wasn't that that nature. He, he, he loves to do this stuff. He's retired. Yeah. But uh, it's so, so appreciated 
him and, and I, I knew him for a while because he's the father-in-law of a friend and um, he's got this, you know, I've talked to him many times. He has the same idea, like, you know, you just do right by your family. You, uh, you tell the truth. And, um, and he was not afraid of working hard. I mean, he was like <laughs> moving yeah. my sink around, you know, it's clearly a lot more muscles than I have at my age, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the funny, uh, connection there. Um, so are there any setbacks that you'd feel comfortable to share, um, in which music has helped you to pull through? I think the major setback that I, I think was significant, especially to my growth was of course, you know, working through this pandemic. Um, it's, I think that the pandemic, of course, you know, a lot of terrible things happened in the past two years and, you know, you always need to keep things in perspective and you always need to keep your own setbacks into perspective. But I'm going to speak honest about, you know, the, the, the troubles that I had and how I pulled through them. And that's, and that's, you know, there's nothing more, nothing less. Cause of course there's people that, that went through worse. And, you know, fortunately during this time I was, ha you know, I was healthy. I was with my family, my family was healthy. And I was so grateful, you know, um, but uh, the pandemic did come at a time where I was graduating college and I needed to make that transition from, you know, being a college student to being, you know, a full time, you know, working either working full time on, on my music. You know, that that was my thing. My plan before was I get out of college and finally I have the time to work on my brand, work on my artistry. 24 seven, you know, no, no homework, no, no, like no science class to deal with. I could just work on my music. I could perform, you know, I had gigs lined up for, for you know, the, the week of the, the week of the pandemic, I had gigs lined up. I was supposed to perform in LA. I was supposed to fly to LA for the first time. I was, you know, I was supposed to play at Rockwood, you know, in the, on the Lower East Side, uh, all of that, all of that done, that all of that was, was, was thrown away because, you know, because of the unfortunate events that happened. Um, and, you know, I was stuck like a lot of other people, you know, in, in a room like this, just staring at the same four walls for the past, you know, six, seven months, you know, having to rework my goals. And, you know, when it comes to songwriting and creating, you need, you need good input in order to have good output. You need to be able to continue to experience new things and, and new influences and, and, and new conversations with people in order to have quality work. And I really felt that just being home alone, of course, and not home alone, but being home, of course, it was great spending more time with the family. But once again, like creatively working was a big pain because just everything I felt like was stale coming out of me, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it was, but of course, I think it took time to recalibrate because what I did learn through this pandemic, and once again, it, it, that, that third thing that I mentioned with the philosophy, like working hard, that's something that I put way much, I put much more time and attention to because of the pandemic. Because now I said to myself, okay, all those plans that I had after college, I have to put on hold because the pandemic is, 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 you know, it's going to stop that from happening. I can't, I can't step outside and, and connect the way I want to, but what I do have is a good amount of time to work on myself. You know, let me, let me set a schedule for myself. Let me wake up early, you know, get cracking on my music early and, and start working on the nuances of, of my personality and my work ethic within music so that once things do open up, which they are now, I'm ready. And I think that that happened. I think that because of, because of, you know, the setback that we all faced, I think that we've all kind of worked on ourselves in a way, you know, a lot of people were influenced to work on themselves and to step back and to be able to kind of improve, you know, sort of like clean out the closet that's been, you know, it's, it's like almost like cleaning out a junky closet that you never have time to, to work on. You know, now you have the time, go clean out the closet and you know what, your life is going to be better because of it. And you're going to be more organized and you're going to be a better person. And now that things are opening up, you know, now I'm ready to, uh, you know, perform more gigs, get back to normal, continue to write more music. And now my music is so much better. You know, I released an EP during this, during this pandemic, and I think it's some of my best work. And the song that I'm working on right now is my best work. 
you know, better than the EP that I released two months ago. You know, it's, blessings can come out of, you know, setbacks in life. And I think that this is one of the major things currently that I'd say it was a challenge, but I improved because of it. Mm -hmm. oh, awesome. I feel that's very, very great to hear you. In Buddhism, there's a phrase called, uh, called changing poison into medicine. And that's, uh, you know, that sounds like what you did with this, you know, you took something that felt like maybe even felt personal to you, like, Hey, don't F up my plans universe. But, uh, but you said, okay, well, this is the chance to go inside to clean out the closet of your life and then yeah. to come out stronger on the other end. And yeah, I think a lot of us have that opportunity and um, anyone who took that opportunity and made the most of it, I think will come out much stronger for sure. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, can you share up to three inspiring books, films, shows, albums? I, I don't know if, if you're much of a reader or whatever it is that you're consuming, but it could be more than three, but you know, let's say someone was bummed out from the pandemic. They're just kind of, you know, beginning to feel themselves or, or maybe still someone's depressed or whatever. What would you recommend to kind of lift people's spirits? Let's see, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on music, obviously, because that's my, that's my, my expertise. You know, of course, you know, I read, you know, I, I've read some good books over the summer, but uh, I think that music is what I, I'm most, you know, what, what's mostly inspired me that I could relate to other people. But of course, like re recommending things can be very personal because I, I would recommend things that have personally touched me, but, you know, it might be different to other people. As a songwriter, you know, I've had certain influences, you know, you know, I, I've listened to, you know, I've, I've been a very old soul when it comes to music. You know, I've listened to the classics. I've listened to classic rock, the Beatles, but I've also been into, you know, influences like, you know, Sinatra. You know, I, I love Ray Charles, as, as we talked about. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald. You know, these are, these are great artists, but I think nowadays I look to like contemporary people as well. And I love honest songwriters. I really love songwriters that are not just strong songwriters that know how to take a, you know, you know, write a good lyric or a great melody, but also be able to, you could say, they, you could tell it's related to their real experiences in life. Andy Grammer is my favorite contemporary songwriter of all time. And he released an album a couple of years ago called The Good Parts. And this is an album where if you wanted to hear really great songwriting, back to front, that album is amazing. And it's a very unique perspective because, you know, usually, you know, you have, you know, usually songwriters, they're young. You know, and I mean, like a lot of contemporary songwriters you hear, they're, they're in their younger parts of their lives, you know, so you hear that kind of perspective. But Andy Grammer, you know, he was, he was relevant for, for maybe like 10, 15 years now, but now he's at a part of his life where he's a father and he's a family man. And, you know, he's, he, 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 this particular album, The Good Parts, is a clear, you know, representation of what he's, what he's going through as, you know, where he is right now. And I think that that's special to hear as a songwriter. So that's one thing. I also love the band called AJR. I think that they do something very similar where they, they write very honest songs based on their own domain. Uh, they're very much my generation. You know, they, 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 they talk about a lot of the problems, you know, with Gen Z, I'd say, that we face. Um, but they're, you know, we, you know, John, you talk about the importance of an album and, and how it is nowadays. I'd say that AJR are making, in a pop sense, in a contemporary music uh, domain, they're the ones that have mastered the concept album. I think that they have two albums out. They have Neo Theater. It's called Neo Theater. And they have a second one called The Click. Both of those are really great albums where, of course, their music is amazing and their production is amazing. But back, front and back, it's a story. It's like a, it's, it's like a, it's like a homage to Sar Sergeant Pepper, almost like, you know, it, everything, everything fits within a certain world that you could get pulled into. So if I'm going to re recommend stuff, I recommend those two things. And I hope that other people would be inspired by it. And, you know, it, it's, it, it's, I don't want to sound like I'm like, oh, I got all this, 
check out my collection, use this, you'll, mm-hmm. you'll find it really. No, I'm very honest with, you know, the things I recommend are things that have touched me and, you know, if it touches you, great, but, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. So Andy Grammer, The Good Parts, and then AJR, Neo Theater, and The Click, both albums are good? Both albums are great, yeah. Okay, cool. I'll put those in the show notes with links. And uh, yeah, of course, I'll put your your social media, your website for people. And by the way, you. by the way, you know, I, I use that opportunity to kind of like talk about things that inspire me. But if you really true want to, you know, you said that this is about, you know, helping you out, especially at the time that we're in, you know, recommending stuff. Any of the songs that I've written that are on Spotify are very much in that similar vein. You know, I try to write about messages that are positive and messages that of, of challenges that I've gone through including the one I just talked about now, you know, there was a song to that. And, and, and uh, I've released music based on those kind of challenges and, and switched it around to the, to, to an upbeat message. And if you listen to any of my music on Spotify, you'll, you'll connect to songs like breathe and breathe out or are who you are, you know, mm-hmm. if, you know, of course, you know, I want to be able to make sure that I say that as well. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. So anyone who's listening, please, um, go and listen to some Marco Verisco. He's, uh, he's on YouTube, he's on Spotify and all your uh, music platforms. And um, yeah, you will be uplifted and you'll probably be impressed when you realize that he, he did this by himself. Well, a lot of it, right? That you did work with some other people uh, it, with some of the material. It's my journey, but of course, you know, you, you, you collaborate with people. You know, right, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. It'd be really yeah. good. Definitely. Um, so if you'd like to share, what are your plans in the upcoming upcoming several months? I know you have a gig coming up. Uh, yeah. Anything you want to announce? So this Sunday, um, if you're in Brooklyn or if you're in New York City, uh, every weekend on Fifth Avenue in Park Slope, you know, near Atlantic Avenue, on Fifth Avenue, they close the streets on the weekends. Uh, that way, all the small businesses during the pandemic, they could kind of like open up, they could stretch their legs and, and let more people in. And uh, of course, you know, bars too could, could you know, host more people in a, in, a, in a safe setting. And of course, you could introduce, once again, live music. So uh, this Sunday at 3.30, I'll be performing uh, uh, at a venue called Lizzie King's Parlor. Um, if you'd like, uh, you know, I'm sure my, I believe my Facebook is connected, you know, to this podcast or you find me on Facebook and you'll see the information for that. But at uh, 3.30, uh, on Sunday at Lizzie King's parlor. That's on fifth Avenue. Um, I'm going to be performing there. So that's one of the things I'll be, uh, that's one of the things coming up for me. Um, when it comes to the next couple of months, like I said, the things that I'm working on is recording more music, releasing more music, uh, and, uh, continuing to, you know, build momentum and continue to reach people with my music. And, um, I mentioned very, very quickly, you know, a new song that I'm working on. It's a song that I've worked on for a couple of months now. And like I said, I'm very happy to say that every every single thing that I've written so far, I always say, this is my best thing. And I'm super excited with this new single that I'm working on right now. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like we talked about, I don't want to overcook it, but I also don't want to undercook it. And I think that it's going to be truly something special. And uh, I'm going to plan to have that released sometime soon. Um, so those are the things coming up for me. Cool. Definitely and, check out my performance. Yeah, and and uh, this isn't a recurring gig, is it? This is the, this one Sunday at the moment. Well, these guys at this venue, they love me. So usually, uh, every maybe every two months, I, I do the I do a similar gig. But this is coming up right now, of course. Yeah, yeah. You know, right. If and you the follow, is beautiful. You know, so yeah. yeah, of course. Awesome. Yeah. So go see Marco live if you're in Brooklyn, or if you're or if you're in the Catskills, drive down if you have to. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, uh, and uh, you, you should, I should mention that you have a new music video. I don't know how new exactly, but it's really spectacle. Well done Thank music you for video. Reminding me. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Uh, once again, something new that I never tried before. You know, I, I collaborated with a great group of people that really was a passion project for me. And this new music video, Crash My Car, is really great. It's got a cool story to it. And you love the music, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so go check out Crash My Car. You can find it on, on YouTube and probably on Facebook too. You release it on Facebook too. I know. Yeah. yeah. It's 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 a lot of fun. It's quite uh quite a spectacle. 
Uh, you could see that your influence in in theater too. I think coming out your actor side, right? And it's uh, a lot of a lot of energy. Yeah, I love the your jumping in your some of your photos and stuff. You jump. I'm like, man, I wish I could jump like that now. I still run, but uh, yeah, <laughs> not jumping so much. But running and jumping that that that's it's energy. It's energy and it works. Yeah, right. No, I totally get it. Um, so uh, just to be specific uh where can people find you and learn more about what you have to offer yeah so you could find me on facebook you know my name marco varisco m-a-r-c-o v-a-r-i-s-c-o yeah you'll find me you know you'll see my profile picture you'll look like me you know you know uh big hair look for the big hair <laughs> um you could also find me on instagram make your marco and uh also Find my Spotify page too. You know, if you find if you find me on Facebook and Instagram, you'll find links to my Spotify page, and you could check out my music. Uh, you know, really great stuff. Of course, www.marcoverisco.com. And uh, like I said, uh, I think now is a good time to you know show appreciation and thank everybody that was in the comment section. I would love to connect with everybody, and you know, this is a really great community, and I think that John has done a great job. Uh, you know, making this community and uh, it's been really great. So, you know, if you, if you, if you want a starting point, definitely my Facebook, my Instagram, my Spotify, you could come back, you could come by on Sunday too as well. And we'll, we'll have a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, uh, for real, Marco's a, a real person, a real cool guy. Uh, so please guys and gals reach out, connect with him. Um, I'm hoping to meet with you in person, Marco, before, before the summer's over. We got to do We got to jam out again. We got to, yeah. we got to, we got to, like, just like old times, John. Yeah, well, let's definitely do it. It'll be fun. And uh, our piano is relatively in tune now. So nice. So we should be good. Right. So, man, it, it's been a lot of fun. I know you and I could talk for another two hours, but uh, I guess we should be I, a little bit. I mean, uh, <laughs> this, this flew by, John, and this was so great. I mean, like, really, really, really cool stuff. You know, I, I love podcasts and I love the, I love the medium and it was, Really great talking to you. There's a lot to talk about. A lot yeah. to catch up on. Yeah, that's right. So who knows? Maybe we'll do a part two one of these days down the line in the next season or something. I mean, you know, fall or winter to see what you've done since then. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so have a wonderful night. Thank you, everybody, for listening, for checking out Music Philosophy and more. Go listen to some of Marco Briscoe's music, watch his videos, and stay inspired. And uh, Marco... Have a fantastic night. Say hi to your family for me. And, Same to uh, you, John. Same to we'll you. Be in touch. I'll send you the links to this in an email later. Of course. All right, um, John. Have a good night. All right. Thanks, Margo. Bye, Take everybody. Care.